Welcome to Kurt Vonnegut's, the podcast dedicated to the life and works and ongoing things of Kurt Vonnegut because he's the greatest author of all time. My name is Alex Schmidt, and I'm joined as always by my co-host, Michael Swaim. Hello. 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 If see if I could tube and throat <laughs> sing, I'd hit. <laughs> We should yeah, get to four-part harmony with just the two of us. That would be some feat. Yeah, right now we're like the Everly Brothers or early Beatles, where it's all who, just thirds. What? You know? Who? <laughs> if we did a Beatles podcast, I would talk about early influences of Again, the Beatles. Again, who? <laughs> but we're not. We're talking about Vonnegut. <laughs> yeah. Kurt Vonnegut. Yeah. And today's book is God Bless You, Mr. Rosewater. Here we are. Mm-hmm. We did it. And uh, thank you guys for talking to us on the internet about Cat's Cradle and all the past books we've done. Oh, yeah. That's from both of us. I signed that, too. Thank you. And we can launch into a first segment called From the Group. Hey, you in the back there. What'd you think? Don't be shy. (laughs) From the group. These get more and more (laughs) character-based every time. Yeah. (laughs) Well, it started as abstract noises, so I... You got to provide some content. Yeah, you got to evolve and read more information. And there's a segment where we uh, talk about just fun things and interesting things and wonderful things that you guys have sent us and said to us about these books. Sort of entice you to come join us on the Facebook page, on Twitter at Kurt Vonna Guys, on Insta Stitch and Grammar C. (laughs) At the org. <laughs> I only know the Facebook one, but we have a lot of fun over there. Yeah. And we, t- we unpack the books a lot more than we have time to do here. So yeah. from the group, who's going first? Well, I, I have a quick one from Twitter, <laughs> do it. which is uh, Evan Billings. He is from Dallas, and he sent us a couple short story recommendations. <gasps> and one of them is a short story called Microcosmic God, and it's by Theodore Sturgeon. And what a perfect one for this book in particular, because Theodore Sturgeon is, we'll get into it more later, but Mm -hmm. Theodore Sturgeon is in many ways an inspiration for Kilgore Trout. And the short story is really, really great. And we can get into it in related reading, I suppose. But that was just a great pull. And uh, thank you for that pick. Yeah, I want people out there to know all the times that I'm like trying to parse that stupid name as if it means something or... Stuff like that, or the the puns. Oh, like a stupid character name. Like you mean? the, the Bokumaru is intermingling of souls, and you're like, could it really be that dumb? Because he's such a smart writer. <laughs> this is a man who knew someone named Theodore yeah. Sturgeon. It was like, I know right. Trout. That's funny. Your name's a fish name. I'm gonna make someone a fish name. <laughs> Like, that blew his mind that someone's yeah. last name could be the same as a fish. <laughs> well, and, right, and that thing you said before of that everyone in Kurt Vonnegut's real life had an insane name. Oh, and yeah. And so his character names are crazy because of that. Like, yeah, <laughs> if he had known one Sarah Smith, right? that's even too wacky because the alliteration. Sarah Jones. Yeah, yeah. We would have really calmed him down. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> My from the group was actually uh, part of a conversation that then extended to email, thankfully. I want to shout out James Black, Vonna guys. Yeah. What are we calling our fans or people who, who are oh, nice enough to... I like Vonna Friends. Vonna Friends is better than mine. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I wanted to call them comma juniors. Oh, boy. Like it goes at the... Do you even know what I mean? Well, because, yeah, everybody forgets that technically his name is Kurt Vonnegut Jr. <gasps> it's not good. It's his not father good. Is Kurt Vonnegut also, well. it puts them beneath us, which I didn't mean. <laughs> like, we're the papas. Anyway, James Black. I'm going to say Dr. James Black. Which I yeah. have no reason to say. Because you sent me his uh, paper, or sort of thesis about it certainly Kilgore. certainly seems smart to me. <laughs> yeah, it's about Kilgore Trout's place within Vonnegut's I work declare and him, Yeah, I declare him I don't Dr. Exactly... James Black Esquire DDS. Yeah. And he very kindly shared with us an excellent, <laughs> and I hope, I think we've got his permission, but we'll share this in the footnotes of the episode. Yeah. Great thesis paper for people who read the book and can't get enough. Just sort of placing Kilgore Trout within the Vonnegut universe, and that's going to come up a lot today because, God bless you, Mr. Rosewater, is now I have some blind spots. There's going to be some books I haven't read that will hit, and I'm excited for that. But of the ones I've read, this is the most trout per pound (laughs) of any Vonnegut book. I mean, he's not just mentioned. He appears as a character. There's a couple others where he's super key and actually shows up, too, but this is yes. the first one. This I don't is... think I've read those, yeah, yeah. so I'm excited to get to them. I know Breakfast of Champions is a huge blind spot, like I should have read that. And I've oh, only oh, seen the Bruce Willis movie version, so, <laughs> <laughs> so that the bar the... is very high, my friend. <laughs> yeah, I'd say that and Timequake. Those are kind of the biggest... Yeah, I just Trout read Time Quake right before we started doing this podcast, but I'll read it again in oh, a few months. Yeah. yeah, so we'll share that. Check it out. 
one of the interesting tidbits is it sort of talks about Kurt Vonnegut as God and Trout as his Jesus figure, <laughs> or like, you yeah. know, the triune God. Jesus is also God, right? But is separate as Jesus as a man on earth. I have some literature to share with you, Alex. <laughs> uh, yeah, so thank you, James, and we'll share that. It's cool. Yeah, it's really a really nice job of also pulling together a few other commentators on yeah. what Kurt does and how his work works. Ooh, essentially. Some tasty citations in there. Yeah, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it's really exciting. If you want to get <laughs> academic about it, it's really neat and really oh, uh, readable. Oh, we're going to get academic <laughs> about it. Sorry. <laughs> Probably wraps up that segment. That would be that should be a Beastie Boys song. Yeah. Oh yeah. That should be it. You gotta fight for your right to Take scholarly pursuits. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> we diverged there. Oi. Yeah. We're As gonna become to, my we're favorite. In a fun mood. We're also just we're gonna become my favorite murder where it's 45 minutes of unrelated at, up top. Delightful <laughs> unrelated tangents, then we get to the book. Yeah. Well, well. also, happy 2017 to you folks listening at home. We are recording this very late 2016. <laughs> yeah, sure. I know. And so, what's the future like? But also, hope you're enjoying this, and we might be in a little bit of a holiday free-for-all mood. Sure. Why, <laughs> blame it on that. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to blame the movement of the calendar. Not the 10 schnapps we split at 9 in the morning. Hey, it's peppermint. You <laughs> exactly. Know? Yeah. Gotta do it. Happy holidays. Yeah. So that's from the group. Yeah. And, and, a, and a wonderful. bonus tangent for you guys, a little <laughs> ramble. Yeah. And from there, I think we can probably get into the book. God Definitely. bless you, Mr. Rosewater. So let's do a segment called Plot Time. Ding, dong, ding, dong. We formed a super clock. It was us. We were one grandfather. That was the Voltron clock, yeah. Yeah, and this book, I feel like it's a really interesting one for plot time because of the Vonnegut I've read and remember this has a pretty simple like bare bones plot if you just cut it down and put it on paper like it's the book is not which is how they make books I don't know some of you kids (laughs) out there know that that used to be the process (laughs) it's a good point (laughs) a lot of dream murder it was great I said Uh, holding my kindle up (laughs) it's not something like sirens where you're moving among six different interplanetary trips oh sirens good times (laughs) this one was great too though I love this book actually yeah this is probably unpopular opinion I don't know if you'll agree but I liked this better than our last selection, Cat's Cradle. And oh. that's almost blasphemous oh, to say. But, yeah, I, yeah. but I don't hate your That's great. Either. We'll get into it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it opens with sort of the Rosewater family story through a, not legal proceeding, but like legal plan. Yes. Have, and I do want to say, since it sounds like you're starting to paint a picture, yeah. which is lovely. Oh, thank you. But I wanted to point out what you pointed out about Cat's Cradle last time. And I got to say, a lot of my commentary about this book, and this is not an insult, it's more like I'm getting to unlock the secrets of one of my favorite brains yeah. by reading all these books in order, which I haven't done. But right. man, the more things change, the more they stay the same. <laughs> the topics are myriad and different, but Vonnegut is not afraid to reuse something that worked. Right. And the reason I say that now is just like Cat's Cradle, before the very first thing, there's already two great quotes. Yeah, Like, right. there are two interesting things said before what you just said, like, <laughs> fade in on something happening. So I'll just say, well, one is just the dedication, which a lot of authors will slip that in there. But yeah. I thought this dedication was remarkably mysterious and made me want to know more about what it's about. For Alvin Davis, the telepath, the hoodlum's friend. Yeah, yeah. Elliot will embody that somewhat. But it makes me want to know about this Alvin Davis. <laughs> he actually, so I looked into it and I had forgotten this, but in Timequake, Kurt is just in Timequake personally. And he says that Alvin Davis was a friend of his, he was a journalist, and that alcohol and gambling kind of did Alvin in, but that they were good, gotcha. good friends for a long time. There you go. Yeah. And then he has a disclaimer, as he's and, wont to have, sort of South Parkish. All persons living and dead are purely coincidental and should not be construed. Oh, there's three. Then I turn. So that's a good one. That's great. Then I turn the page and there's yet a third one I forgot, which is uh, an opening quote from Elliot Rosewater, who will become the titular and most important character. And that quote is, the Second World War was over. And there I was at high noon crossing Times Square with a purple heart on Elliot Rosewater, president of the Rosewater Foundation. 
And before we even dive into the book, and I'm sorry I'm undermining plot time. No, no, no. Can you explain it to me, Daddy? (laughs) Because as we were talking about the stupid puns, my brain can only go to... Is it supposed to be a hard-on joke? I walk through Times Square with a purple hard-on? That was my takeaway. Okay. Yeah. Why is that the opening line (laughs) of the book? What's that? What's Kurt getting at there? (laughs) I was a little bit confounded by it. Uh, Okay. I don't get it. Yeah. I don't understand that Elliot quote. Great. And I think we can go from there with no further comment because we can talk about it with our group later. Yeah. But I, And I want to get into the plot, but I just wanted to start out by saying, A, Kurt always front loads very well. Yeah. And B, the reason I like this book and the reason if you're out there listening to this, you might want to read it is if you're like me, you like things where... There's a lot of things that resonate deeply and you immediately understand them and they click very powerfully and there'll be a lot of that in this book. Yeah. But you like things that have maybe 25% of it you don't get, even though you're, re- you're smart and you thought about it. Sure. It still yeah. haunts you because it's mysterious. And so that line, and there are a few lines throughout and concepts throughout that I'm like, I th- usually think Kurt Vonnegut's right. And I don't understand this, so I feel like it's an unlocked secret of the universe. And that's why I kind of like this one more than Cat's Cradle. It's not straightforward. Cat's Cradle is a very neat plot. Yeah. And this one is like, reminded me like George Carlin or Richard Pryor just like ranting truth at you. And then when they think of something new, they're like, also this shit is true. <laughs> so yeah, the plot is bare bones, like but it's yeah. very digressive, quite yeah. like this episode. Well, also, my <laughs> best guess at the quote about Second World War of Purple Heart, Elliot's another Vonnegut character who we find out later in the book where the Second World War is pretty foundational to who they will be going forward. The experiences in it are insane. And so it's, it's and that's common to a lot of his books and his own life. Yes. And so I feel like maybe it's a reference to that, but it feels so oblique that I, I don't know what he's quite getting at right there. I don't yeah. either. Yeah. But I like Help it for us some out, reason. folks. All right. Or, or, yeah. or just throw us your own thought on yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, the opening of the book, completely abstract. Yeah. It starts in the midst of a description of a legal proceeding. Yeah. Yawn. <laughs> <laughs> Close book. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> no stay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The very first line, once we're past the great opening lines before the book starts, is a sum of money is a leading character in this tale about people, just as a sum of honey might properly be a leading character in a tale about bees. Which I feel and that's a little blurty, and we'll do blurts later, but I feel like it's a brilliant way to make a legal proceeding fascinating right away and keep you going. True. I think the first part of that line is great. And the second part is lame. <laughs> 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 Just yeah. as Kurt blurts go, I hold him to yeah. a high standard, but as blurts go, I'm like, okay, people make money. Bees make honey. Honey and money rhyme. Let's move on. <laughs> oh, yeah. It is pretty right. I'm, I'm yeah. just I'm saying as an analogy, you couldn't write a thesis paper about it. There's not a lot to unpack. So let's not. Right. Let's move on. <laughs> but that sum of money is $87,472,033.61 on June 1st, 1964. Yeah. Because as we all know, sums of money fluctuate greatly moment to moment. And the reason he picked that day to check in on the sum of money is because that's the day that Norman Mushari, our first human character in the book, took notice of it (laughs) and decided, well, he's a lawyer, not just because he's a lawyer, but he's a lawyer and he decided, I want that money. (laughs) Yeah. I want to cut. Right. Mushari is presented as somebody who basically their purpose is to be a lawyer. And there's someone Mm -hmm. who is looking for a situation where money will change hands and where he can insert himself into it. And he's been taught by his mentor that that's the way to be a a lucrative lawyer, is find where money will change hands, be just involved in it in some way, and then you'll make a fortune. It was a great speech. It's very Wolf of Wall Street-ish, McConaughey. And there's another scene later I'll call out as that, too, as Wolf of Wall Street-y. But in this one, it's like if McConaughey told him, look, when money is changing hands, the person getting the money, especially if they're poor or middle class, often feels guilt. Because they have a working moral compass that makes them feel like it's unfair that they should just get all this money. Right. So you, as someone who has no conscience whatsoever, are in a very good position to leverage their feelings of guilt and have a transaction whereby 
they give you a big chunk of the money for very little work and it makes them feel like, well, that's how life works. You know how life always fucks you? Like, that's that comforting feeling I'm used to is, of course, a gu- some, some authoritative entity in a suit is, is going to take half of my lotto winnings, of course. Right. So people will tend to not question it, even though it's bullshit that you take half their money for doing six hours of work. Yeah. So just make sure you're around when very <laughs> rich people are exchanging money. So when he sees this sum of money... Basically, his goal becomes to make it be exchanged, which I think is such a great idea for a heist movie, basically. From Mushari's point of view, it's a heist movie, and the only thing he has to do to achieve his goal is not steal the money, but have the money exchange hands from one rich person to another rich person and be the lawyer who represents the recipient. So right. that's his goal. <laughs> yeah. Well, also just that overall idea spoke to me big time because I feel like not knowing about the law or not knowing about finance makes those people basically wizards. Like those people are in charge of a process that you're just kind of trusting them if you don't know it exactly. And there have been times in my life where I'm like, oh, oh boy, totally. I either need yeah. to learn a whole lot real fast or this person's kind of in charge of what's going on here. Yeah. And we're going to talk a lot about money, because that's what the book's about. Yeah. But, yeah, I think money's like that. At the highest levels, if you haven't spent all your time learning about money, but you still want some money, right? you have to rely on someone who all they did was learn about money and how it moves around. Yeah. And uh, that's very complex, and it can be mystifying, and that gives that person a lot of control. Right, right. It's either terrifying, or you have someone you trust. Yeah. And, you know. But we don't so trust Norman Mushari because about. our introduction to him is that his theme song is Pop Goes the Weasel <laughs> and his coworker is named Leonard Leach. <laughs> so like, yeah, he's a lawyer. Get it? <laughs> well, <he laughs> also, one of the bad kind. He also works at a law firm where one of the partners is named Rob Gent, which is just a great oh, like, see? Dickensian I didn't catch that name. one. I caught Leonard Leach as one of the other partners. Yeah. That's obvious. And I'll, I didn't get that one. And Rob, a gentleman. Yeah, <laughs> right. Rob Gent. Yeah. So it's very Dickens and very Vonnegut. Just like, this person's name is what they do. Here you go. And Mushari is pitched as basically a very low-level lawyer, very starting out and very focused on nothing but making some money at this. He has no friends. He eats alone in crummy restaurants. He just sits around waiting for his chance to make a bunch of money from the law. Yeah. And as far as him achieving that, And as far as chapter one goes, (laughs) the things you learn just sort of have described to you as Vonnegut is wont to do is that that sum of money, the 80 some million dollars is protected and was protected generations ago by the Rosewater family by entrusting it to a philanthropic organization called the Rosewater Foundation. So the Rosewater Foundation nominally is a charity organization, but as is the case with a lot of these foundations. It was founded very transparently because a charitable foundation is tax exempt. So it was just to not have to pay taxes on that $84 million. Now, how do you not do that forever? That's the goal. How do you keep that money forever? (laughs) That was the goal by uh, who is their their ancestor who... Noah? Oh, yes. Who founded the fortune originally by ripping off his brother. Yeah, Noah Rosewater. So the way he saved this fortune is he founded the foundation and makes sure that it's part of the foundation's bylaws that a rose water, someone who has rose water blood, yeah. when they come of age, becomes like the king of the rose water. They're the president of the rose water foundation. Now, our legal system, if you didn't know, does feebly try to stop rich people from doing this by saying, okay, well, if you're a charitable organization, that's not your money anymore. You can't touch it. Right. Well... You kind of can, though, because (laughs) they formed a corporation called the Rosewater Corporation. The Rosewater Corporation manages the Rosewater Foundation's money, and by law, no Rosewater can be a part of the corporation. But what they can do is take 100% of the corporation's profits and spend it however they want. And the corporation's profits are only the interest earned on that $84 million, which comes out to, they said, $3.5 million a year. So... Basically, after all this legal folderall, he calls it in the book, <laughs> yeah. you have the descendants of the Rosewaters in modern day are people who get three and a half million dollars a year to do whatever they want with. That's their life. Yeah, it's all, yeah. And so it's all set up where there's just a big pot of money 
and it funds the existence of the Rose Waters, and that's about all it does. And it also is based on land in Indiana and also owning some office space in New York and a few other investments and things like that. Yeah. And I think it's interesting to note just how, again, it's such a Vonnegutism. He's basically Rockefeller, right? Yeah. Although they mention Rockefellers existing <laughs> and they look down on them. But he's a fictionalized <laughs> Rockefeller, just like Campbell was a fictionalized Nazi, you know, fictionalized Goebbels. Yeah. And, or Eichmann, I guess, because of the propaganda aspect. And just like uh, Honecker is a fictionalized Oppenheimer. <laughs> he does a lot of World War II, Dresden firebombing, and he does a lot of, let's look at this sector of society through a fictionalized version of like, Again, like if the Wolf of Wall Street guy wasn't real, right. and they made that movie anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so as if you hadn't guessed already or you weren't familiar, this is going to be the book where he talks about income disparity yeah. and rich people and poor people and Wall Street and all that. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. also it, as we find out about the Rosewaters and how they work, we learn it from a letter from Elliot and also just research that Mashari does. And as you learn about their family tree, he keeps working in real versions of the Rosewater family that he's invented. Like they're related to the Rockefellers and the Morgans and the McCormicks and all these mm -hmm. other. And also they're related to the Rumfords. So we also have yeah, them go. related to the fictional super rich people that we already have in Vonnegut to set up yeah. the fictional other rich people. And I feel like I want to throw out something I should have said at the very top of the show, which is like. Okay, when we first started doing this podcast, I heard from people on the other end of the political spectrum from myself, which I will leave that vague, <laughs> who were like, oh, I can't believe you chose Vonnegut because he's like the liberal Ayn Rand, like he's the Michael Moore of, and uh, I didn't know that. I, yeah, I mean, huh. he's very like, let's share the money and love each other based. Yeah. But I didn't know that to a sector of the population, his politics are seen as like whiningly, annoyingly liberal. <laughs> and this is the right. one book where I feel like I want to say, like, if you're a conservative when it comes to uh, the economy, you're probably going to think this is a bunch of whiny liberal nonsense. Yeah. Well, I... <laughs> and here we go. Because uh, all my blurts and like, I think the most poignant aspects of the novel very much <laughs> are a liberal view of economic policy, redistributing huh. the wealth. Elliot is accused of being a Marxist repeatedly. Yeah. And I think he replies very uh, wisely or sagely. Uh, well, yeah, I didn't try to be, but you can't really help poor people without tripping over the Communist Manifesto, just like you can't really help poor people without tripping over the Bible. Oh, burn. <laughs> burn <laughs> Christian conservatism. <laughs> That's a super interesting because I have not personally read Ayn Rand. I should admit that. <laughs> but I get the sense that Ayn Rand is, at least economically, it's she's super conservative, but also to the extent where it's impossible. You know, like it's so conservative. Mm, it's free enterprise. That, she just puts all her chips down on. It should be evolution, sink or swim right. with no regulations and let people fight it out until the best people are there without looking any deeper about any of the systems that rig <laughs> that game. But so, yeah, yeah, and I think I just am saying that I think from the other side of the looking glass, it's fair to say, or people at least think, in the way that after you finish reading a good Ayn Rand book, for a while at least, <laughs> you're super conservative, or at least when it comes to free enterprise economics. Yeah. And uh, yeah, after reading God Bless You, Mr. Rosewater, for a while, you might be super, super communisty. Just yeah. like after reading uh, V for Vendetta, I was really into anarchism. And after reading <laughs> Eating Animals by Jonathan Safran Foyer, I was like, I will never eat a dead animal again it lasted three months but books have a powerful effect on the brain <laughs> <laughs> yeah no i get yeah whatever you're coming away from it's like like when i finished watching the movie drive and i was yeah. driving home i was like i'm gonna be a, i'm just gonna be a really cool driver like, i'm just right gonna now. drive i'm awesome <laughs> uh, i'd say i understand that idea of Oh, Kurt Vonnegut is like a liberal Ayn Rand, but having not read Ayn Rand, so I admit I may not be capable <laughs> of Rand. making this. No, I would argue that I get the sense that Ayn Rand is super economically conservative without being critical of her own position at all. And I would argue that Kurt is super economically liberal while sort of painting 
the results of that, which is Elliot, as being ridiculous. You know what I which mean? Which is like, funny I think because he yeah. is cognizant of the limits of his position somewhat, and I, from what I have perceived of Ayn Rand, I perceive that she is not. And I also agree that that makes his standpoint more valid, but it's funny yeah. to like flip the lens on ourselves and say like, I don't know, it's funny that you're like, well, yeah, his opinions are really extreme, but at least he hates himself. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which to me actually, I mean, which is like a weird... in my life, that is more authentic <laughs> to the way life is. It's like, yeah. Well, he stands by his beliefs, but at least he doubts them as well. <laughs> right, right. And so that might just be like a personality thing or something. I think it know? is. Yeah, yeah, sure. Like a lot of things in life. But the reason I bring it up now is this whole chapter, yeah, is Elliot <laughs> writing a letter to whomever is the Rosewater that may take over after him. Yeah. And uh, it's interesting to think about, because by the end of this book, someone will take over the Rosewater Foundation from him. Right. And it's interesting to think about Fred Rosewater reading this letter, mayhap, on a future <laughs> date. But the letter basically is a straight-up tirade or, like, op-ed piece <laughs> yeah. where he says the history of their fortune and sort of highlights the hypocrisy of rich people. Basically saying, you know, Noah made his fortune by war profiteering during the Civil War because everyone was so worried about the war, they said no price is too high to pay for the Union. So yeah. he charged a very very high price. And <laughs> then he used that money. And I think this is important to note just because of the whole mass media argument that we're having play out right now in society. His son, Samuel, the first person to inherit the $84 million or however much it was at the time. Yeah. Samuel bought newspapers and preachers too. He gave them a simple lesson to teach and they taught it well. Anybody who thought the United States of America was supposed to be a utopia was a piggy, lazy, goddamn fool. <laughs> so they very shrewdly became rich using the American dream model yeah. and immediately used that money to seize media, use that money to seize control of media and spout out the message that you should abandon the American dream. There's no more room. We took the money. Just keep working for us, you assholes. <laughs> so they're the worst of... What a liberal person, I guess, would view like a financial social climber who has no moral compass whatsoever. And he really goes in depth into this Rosewater family tree, which is partly a very Vonnegut world building through families sort of thing, but also very particular to this fortune is almost monarchical, like it is going through bloodline and through the family specifically. And it starts from a pair of brothers, George Rosewater and Noah Rosewater, where the Civil War happens and George's response is, I'm going to form a military unit from here in Indiana and we're going to go fight for the Union. We're going to do it. And Noah is like, great, time to make some money. And so then the whole trajectory of it from there is Noah marrying someone who can also add to the fortune, taking money from his brother, and then just trying to build that wealth yeah. out. I feel like Vonnegut is very much pitching these two brothers as one of them does think, hey, the U.S. can be this utopia, and the other doesn't. And the one who doesn't has nothing but success come his way. Exactly. Yeah, it's very Ender and Peter Wigan. Yeah. Or uh, oh yeah. Or just like Cain and Abel. Like they right. are. They're the old timey ancestors who represent the two extremes, and everything flows from that. And my favorite image of them is during the Civil War. J Noah. Noah's the bad one. From my worldview, yeah. yeah, yeah. Noah paid a bunch of money because they already had some wealth at the time to not go to war, right? In civil war, it was common to pay a poor person to go to the war on your behalf. Right. And basically, there's digs between the brothers. So George, the brother who did go to war and believe in utopia, wrote him just to say, hey, hope the family's well. I thought you should know. The guy who's like, quote unquote, you was yeah. horribly killed today. <laughs> Greetings from the trenches of the Civil War. Wish you were here, George. <laughs> like the letter literally ends with wish you were here, which is awesome. Yeah. And I think so insightful to the worldview that we're going to explore here. Noah, the profiteer, writes back, I wish you would be more thoughtful when you write home to the family as you know, because of the war, we're experiencing many deprivations here at home. <laughs> we All of our food is bland and subpar because we sent all the best food to the soldiers. So, like, you're welcome. And if you could say thank you, it would be appreciated. Right. Your, your brother Noah. <laughs> and then when George gets back, he finds out Noah legally screwed him of 
all of his ownership of the business they started together and took all his money. Right. Yeah. And that's where this $84 million came from, among other places. Yeah, yeah. Because Noah builds this massive fortune and sort of tracking the way a lot of these very wealthy families go. Like even the, even the Rockefellers do this very literally to an extent. Noah is all of the money, and then his son Samuel buys up all of the press and, and becomes like a leading figure of opinion. Samuel's son Lister becomes a U.S. senator, and then he marries a woman named Eunice Elliott Morgan, and then she is a very artistic person. Like She's a chess champion, and she writes a historical novel and cares about the poor. And so this combination of a very, very Rosewater senator and his very artistic and caring wife creates Elliot Rosewater, our main character in the book. It's great because it's just the perfect story structure as far as, like, yeah, that's the rise of the tycoon family yeah. in a nutshell put so well. Yeah. First generation makes the money doing something useful but morally unsavory. <laughs> Second generation launders the money yeah. by owning the message. Right. Third generation now is indistinguishable from the establishment. Fourth generation finally is like... I was born rich, so I feel guilty about it. So let's found charities and expunge all the things we did yeah. three generations ago. I don't know if it was Rockefeller, but one of those tycoons famously said, yes, I crushed little people knowingly to climb to the top of the mountain. But it's okay, because now that I'm here, I'm going to help more little people than I crushed. Yeah. I think it was Rockefeller. Rockefeller and paraphrasing. Carnegie but. had that principle, too. Carnegie, that, like, that's what I was give, thinking like, of, yeah. Earn your money. And then build your thing and then spend it and then well, give yeah. it all away. He yeah. thought business as business was okay up until you make your fortune. Then you're allowed to like make up for what you did. Right. <laughs> if you do the charity part, <laughs> the end part of your life well enough and you're, you're a giver. <laughs> so Elliot's set up to be the way Elliot's going to be. And we get his whole life story going into chapter two, sort of. Kind of like Bokanons, like if he was an unremarkable Bokanon. <laughs> yeah. By which I mean he has military service, he has academia, and he has wealthy parentage, and he has disillusionment, and he has wandering seeking his destiny. But where Bokanon was an A student who was always destined to be a prophet, Elliot kind of sucked at everything and is mediocre his whole life. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and also, I love the connection to Bokanon there because we also have Elliot writing a letter about his own story where he insults himself, which is the kind of thing Bokanon would do a lot. Yeah. Like Elliot, in his own letter, writes, and Elliot became a drunkard, and an utopian dreamer, a tin horn saint, an aimless fool. Yeah. Like He says, they use a lot of the biblical begat in this letter uh -huh, to describe yeah. people producing people. Elliot says, begat he not a soul. Like You're talking about yourself, man. That's yeah, great. exactly, yeah. <laughs> and uh, he is wandering in life and also literally will go on, will like disappear for weeks and wander around the country drunk, just talking to yeah. people and come back home. And finally, when he comes of age and they say, by the way, just as an aside, now that you're 21, you're the president of the Rosewater Foundation. That's where your money's always been coming from, but now you're nominally the president. Right. And it's this charity thing. Unfortunately, says the book, <laughs> he takes the foundation seriously. Unlike every predecessor who was president of the foundation, he believes them when they say the goal of this money is to save the world and make a utopia. And right. he goes like, oh, this is my destiny. So he immediately starts to actually run it very charitably. And yeah. they say like, Rosewater money fought cancer and police brutality and anything bad that you care to think of. They threw all the money at it in the world. He had a soft spot for firemen. So he buys yeah. volunteer firefighters all over the country, like all new equipment, and does all the kinds of good stuff with the Rosewater Foundation money. <laughs> at the same time, his alcoholism is becoming more and more rampant, which ends in a scene of him getting... <laughs> This is the other Wolf of Wall Street scene, I thought. <laughs> getting so drunk that he gets dragged out of like a charity event, and uh, oh, there's yeah. a huge crowd... And he says he has a poem that he just composed about the Rosewater Foundation. And it goes, many, many good things have I bought. Many, many bad things have I fought. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what gives his life meaning, I guess, at that point yeah. in life. And throughout the book, he consumes copious amounts of alcohol. And oh, Vonnegut says that people decided, well, he never seems to actually be drunk. He just keeps putting it away and... I guess it's fine. You know? But then he does later seem but drunk. But then he definitely seems drunk often. <laughs> it yeah. gets worse and worse, yeah. 
It really reminded me, honestly, my girlfriend Jennifer is a social worker and faced, just finished grad school and sort of faced this decision. It's this interesting thing because very shortly what he's going to do is start helping people on a one-to-one basis. Yeah. And that becomes the meat of the book, basically. Not trying to trigger a new segment. Do not play a trophy <laughs> no, no, for no, the no. meat. No, no, no. But he starts helping people literally like... I come to your house and I just see what I can do for you. In this phase of his life, he wants to help people and he's doing it in the way a rich person normally does, which is from a distance by just giving money to poor people. And it's the difference in social work is called macro or micro, right? Micro is working, going to a home or in a therapy situation, helping an individual human being with what's going on in their life. Macro is like trying to pass laws or if you happen to have a ton of money, putting money places you think the money's going to help. Right. And it's so interesting to me because Jen lived through this and it's totally accurate, but it seems like Elliot does this in the book, which is it's very arguable that macro is what really changes things, right? Yeah. Like if he could have passed the Rosewater bill and, geez, I'm really going to wear my political heart on my sleeve here, but like <laughs> defunded the privatization of the prison system, right. that would make a huge impact in a lot of ways. <laughs> but... Way more impact than like helping Diana Moon Glampers because she's scared of the lightning. Right. But it's it's like acting in film versus acting on stage. It just doesn't give you that hit of feeling <laughs> like you help a so poor soul. Right. And so I think he does undermine Elliot because I think Elliot does a lot of laudable things and has a lot of laudable ideals. But one of the things he does is help people because it makes him feel good. And he wants the kind of helping people situation that makes him feel the best. So he like ends up going to the gutter and finding crazy people to help because that feels more Jesus-y yeah. than spending millions of dollars to fight AIDS, even though that's super important. You should spend millions of dollars to fight AIDS. <laughs> yeah. Well, he because he's even going around the town, like giving people just an amount, like you're an individual person, here's some money. But yeah, if he created some kind of universal basic income law or something, whether or not that's a good idea, that would be much more impactful. But instead he spends his time doing the thing where he gets to see and hear and feel the impact of helping that specific person. Yeah. And his love and his money is truly unconditional. They talk about him. Yeah. I don't remember if it was a rape or just a statutory rape, but someone, a woman in the town gets pregnant with an unwanted pregnancy and the dude's obviously like a creep and is in jail. And he's in jail because the Rosewater Foundation found out about, I just don't have time to flip through. It's either a rape or like she's underage, but they find out about it. They report the guy to the police. They give a bunch of money to support the child's being raised and They hire the rapist dude the best lawyer money can buy for his defense in the trial. (laughs) Right. So it's like literally anyone Anyone that stumbles upon Elliot Rosewater, his checkbook is open to you. Yeah. 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 And his time and his heart and and everything else. We should probably get into how he gets to there, right? Please shut me up. You need to talk a lot more for a while. (laughs) (laughs) No. So Elliot is someone who, as far as his character biography, he goes off to... World War II, and it just has horrible experiences there with a massacre, and it essentially breaks his brain a little bit. So he gets the equivalent of PTSD, and he's put in a hospital in Paris, and while he's being cared for there by various people, one of them is a beautiful woman named Sylvia, who falls in love with him immediately, and then they marry, they come back to the U.S., and Elliot is supposed to be running the foundation, But then, if I remember right, he also falls apart because of the trauma of this and because also he is trying to figure out how to be a good person in a crazy world. And should we say what happened in World War II? Are you saving that? It's revealed late in the book, but just for chronology, I think. I suppose chronologically. Well, we're on it. He accidentally bayoneted a 14-year-old kid who was a volunteer firefighter. (laughs) Yeah. Hence his obsession with helping the volunteer firefighters of this nation as much as he possibly can and thinking they're the best people in the world. Because basically in the middle of a battle, he ran into a building that he didn't realize was a burning building. And in the middle of a war, despite the danger to themselves, there was a volunteer firefighting team trying to put the fire out and he killed them all because he thought they were soldiers in the house. And one of them was a 14-year-old kid and that'll fuck you up. Yeah, he had been told they were German troops, and so he was like, ah, here we go. And he kills them. I mean, they teach you everything 
in boot camp, but the one thing they don't teach you is how to live with making a mistake. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> Bruce Willis, bringing it back around. Thanks, Sarge. Yeah. Well, it's Die Hard. <laughs> oh, right, yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and also, it, not to get too blurdy, but they're, after Elliot kills the fireman, there's a part where they tell him this and he finds out, and then the way Vonnegut puts it is, Elliot seemed reasonably well for about 10 minutes after that, and then he calmly lay down in front of a moving truck. <laughs> yeah. It's just such a perfect like. Oh, I get it. Sure, sure. Obviously, has lost it. Something, yeah. something just fundamentally is broken in him. And up until he this accidentally point, killed he's been... his mom in a sailing accident. Let's throw yeah. that in there. Yeah, true. Um, yeah, they make several allusions to the fact that this is someone who feels that they have done evil in the world and they need to atone. Yeah, it's not explicitly said, but it's heavily implied that that's part of what drives him to want to help everyone. Is he's like. I was born rich. I didn't have to work for it. And I'm responsible for four innocent deaths <laughs> that I know of. <laughs> like, right. I got to work this off, <laughs> this <laughs> debt off. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and from there, his mind retreats to charity. It also retreats to science fiction writing. Once he's really breaking down and drunkenly on a, a very, I guess, kind rampage, bender. I would say. Yeah, yeah. a bender, right. He, he shows gets drunk up. and travels around the countries. A yeah. jag, a spree. <laughs> And he, he shows up to a convention of science fiction writers and just thanks them for being them. And, yeah. Uh, I mean, come on, Kurt. If I <laughs> right. wrote a goddamn crack sketch, where you say, like, I mean, hands sketch God, writers are heroes. We get like Joss Whedon to do a guest spot on After Hours. You think I'm going to have him poke his head in and go, you know what's great? The show After Hours <laughs> and the comedy writers are crack. Right. You're the real future and tellers of truth because that's what he has. <laughs> he has Elliot come in to a, a sci fi convention and literally say, you are the most important people in the world. You are the people that are right. telling the truth, and no one will goddamn listen to you. Right. And I thought Player Piano was really good. <laughs> and no one's buying it, basically. He just right. goes and fillets the sci-fi writers. Although one of my uh, favorite quotes in the book is, Elliot admitted later on that science fiction writers couldn't write for sour apples, but he declared that it didn't matter. Right, right. Man. That's why Harlan Ellison's my favorite, is because he obviously really cares about writing, word to word. Yeah, yeah. But it's goddamn true, man. Even as a sci-fi fan, I have to admit it. Like, sci-fi writers are so, and fantasy, by and large, there's so much about the cool idea sparking your imagination. Most of them can't write for shit. Like, the writing is garbage. Yeah, especially (laughs) going back to some of the sci-fi I really, really liked as a kid, when I think I was a little more accepting of it. Bradbury's good, but Heinlein... Yeah. All of his ideas are amazing. His writing is fine to mediocre. Well, I, I was rereading <laughs> Moon as a Harsh Mistress, and it's very poorly written. Dated as it, hell. It, yeah. <laughs> it's, there's cool ideas, and then the one female character in it is just so objectionable. Yeah. I had to stop. <laughs> it's like, I'm yeah. out. Great. I feel that way about a lot of that stuff. <laughs> this will get cause trouble, but like Harry Potter, I thought, this is such an amazingly well thought out sequence of things happening yeah. written so poorly <laughs> oh i disagree right. that's okay a lot a of people writer. do just didn't float my boat she's a little bit dickensy in in where i like what I, they're doing but i can see i think dickens is overrated too honestly yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right it like moves really well and, the, and the, it, there's things i like about it that i can see how it wouldn't. sure anyway fuck everyone you like let's move on <laughs> and uh in the process of Elliot thanking the science fiction writers. We're sort of hearing about that through Mushari reading about it. And Mushari realizes that he needs to research Elliot's absolute favorite science fiction writer, which is Kilgore Trout. And here we go. Kilgore Trout, the big uh, Vonnegut character. Here he is in this book for the first time. And Mushari goes out to try to get a copy of the Kilgore Trout book that Elliot's most into called To Be or Zero To Be, or you would probably to read be it To Be or to are Not To Be. Not you know, To Be, yeah. I guess, if you're British. <laughs> uh, right. So he goes to find it, and the place he can find it is a porn shop. So it's in between the Kama Sutra and other things like that. He finds To Be or Not To Be, which Kurt writes that in as a novel that Kilgore Trout wrote. But in 1962, 
Kurt wrote To Be or Not To Be as a short story. And so here in 1965, when God Bless You, Mr. Rosewater comes out, now that's been turned into a Kilgore Trout novel, which is more some just right away blurring of is Trout Vonnegut is Vonnegut. Trout? Yes. And when he unpacks the plot of To Be or Not To Be eventually, it's basically player piano with a different ending. Yes. So there's a lot of swirling layers within layers of like, yeah. Automation, people, uselessness, people without a purpose, people are useless because their jobs have been automated. Did you get it yet? There's like, <laughs> it's funny. It's a book of like, it read to me. And again, if this were not well executed, this would be an insult. But in this book, I think it's a compliment. It's a book where there's like nine Kurt Vonnegut's. Yes. Who all just talk as Kurt Vonnegut, but they have different shades. It really is just a crashing of ideologies together in a lot of ways. Yeah. And with like people who just represent that ideology and talk about it. Interesting side note to the porn shop. In the book, he posits that sci-fi is often found in porn shops, which I didn't know, by the way. I, know I didn't the, either. Yeah. I know the Playboy fosters a lot of good sci-fi short stories but i think i think that's also an artifact of us being alive when there are not really porn stores book shops sure but uh, <laughs> yeah <laughs> posits the porn and sci-fi go together because both are about fantasies of an impossibly uh, hospitable world <laughs> love it yeah i love describing porn as an impossibly hospitable world yeah so mushari i realize we should have mentioned this right at the top the reason he's doing this is there's a bylaw that states that if he can prove Elliot is insane, yes, that's the only way to depose Elliot as president of the Rosewater Foundation. Yeah, so that's why he's doing all this digging. It's with the goal of proving he's insane. Right. That's how Mushari is kind of bringing us through Elliot's whole life because he's researching it in order to destroy him. And then Vonnegut describes Mushari more as somebody who. Nobody has liked his whole life. He also uses the thing of Mushari built model airplanes and masturbated most of his childhood. Yeah. Which So that comes up again. That's it's, sort of a recurring thing. Yeah, it's a straight up books. Simpsons did it. Yeah. Like he uses the exact word for word epithet. He was like, I really liked that jerking off and model airplanes bit. Let's <laughs> reuse that. Yeah. And then the addition for Mushari is that additionally that stuff he plasters his bedroom walls with posters of Joseph McCarthy and Roy, and Roy Cohn, Cohn, who are just <laughs> just not people that any child any is interested child in. For any reason. <laughs> it makes you want to know his whole life story. Like what parents how do you find a poster of Roy Cohn? <laughs> Did he make it? Yeah, yeah. And so from there, we continue to follow Elliot falling apart, alienating friends, losing his sort of rich connections. Eventually, he gets brought to a doctor named Ed Brown, who is the first normal name in a long time. And Brown <laughs> tries to figure out Elliot's neurosis, and he says that it's completely untreatable. Elliot finally fully breaks down at an opera, I like the Vonnegut line where he says that Sylvia leads him away as easily as she might have led a toy balloon. Mm -hmm. And then from there, Elliot pretty much fully disappears as he goes on this jaunt all over the country. Again. Yes. We also take a brief cesura for Vonnegut to present Lister, his dad, who's a senator, as we mentioned. Yeah. By the way, good namey thing there, Lister. And he's very sterile. I think that's oh. got to be, or, you know. Oh, yeah, totally. He lacks any kind of empathy for anyone. Yeah, like the inventor of Lister. Yeah. Name. yeah. They counterpoint his letter, which is basically, and I don't want to get off on a rant here, about the evils of money <laughs> and the class system in America with... Lister's speech to the Senate, where yeah. he d gives the conservative viewpoint of why liberalism is full of shit. Right. And uh, I want to give that because that's yeah, yeah. fair. Totally. <laughs> and he's basically, his argument is he compares this current society to the fall of Rome. Or I'm sorry, not the fall, the golden age of Rome. And he talks about how the golden age of Rome came about and purports, I don't know if this is true or not, that the golden age of Rome came about when they finally decided to encode morality into the law and have harsh punishments. Uh, like we talked about with the San Lorenzans on the, it's like a pro hook stance. Yeah. Like you got to be willing to execute people if they don't pray enough, because if you're not willing to encode morality into law, people won't blah, 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 blah. Yeah. He hates leeches and takers and what we would call the welfare class and right. <laughs> talks about how People who care for those people are the people in Rome who thought you should love everyone so much that we should love the barbarians enough to open the gates and let in the barbarians. And right. guess what happened when they did that? 
Rome was sacked by barbarians. Boom. So he ends by saying, the only way to maintain the beautiful society that is America is either to chop off people's hands if they steal or blaspheme or have a free market capitalist system because that has the harshness of survival of the fittest built into it. Right. And that's what spares us from having to do unsavory things like chopping off thieves' hands is the system that ensures that if you're a thief, most of you end up poor and then homeless and then die. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it's the free market enterprise system, but of course, because it's through Vonnegut's words, said very artfully and compared to the golden age of Rome. Yeah. And so he basically ends up scaring you with chopping off hands and then says, thankfully, we don't have to do that. All we have to do is have a completely unregulated Wall Street and banking system <laughs> where everyone does whatever they want to make as much money as they possibly can. Right, right. Because <laughs> that'll purely reward and punish people for strength and weakness. And, and... and I understand the compelling logic of people who think that because on paper, that sounds right. If it were a pure meritocracy where people who had merit and worked hard made the money... That would be a great, that would be a seemingly fair system. <laughs> yeah, it has a simplicity to it in a good way. Like, yeah. it's not as simple that it's stupid. It's simple that it, no. oh, that just seems to work. Evolution's a real good system. Cool. So it's all you're saying is, why don't we do that? Right. Why don't we do the evolution one? <laughs> yeah, and social like, well, Darwinism, sure. Because <laughs> it's kind of too late, because there's the money river, which right. we will get to. <laughs> right, right, yeah. So Elliot, Elliot goes nuts. He travels around the country drinking more and more, doing more and more. And basically, in my estimation, the implication is learns that he enjoys helping people on a one-to-one -one basis in a way that he never got anything out of running the foundation. So he writes to Sylvia, his estranged wife, often telling her what all the crazy shit he's getting up to. Side note that's really funny. He ends one of the letters calling himself Hamlet and her Ophelia, and she will end up living the rest of her life in a nunnery. Get thee to a nunnery go is a line that Hamlet says to Ophelia. Yeah. That's got to be intentional. What? But he tells her basically very excitedly, oh, am I jumping the gun? Is there something you want to say before this? No, I, there's just another Hamlet thing is one of the oh, places Elliot please. rambles to is a town in California called Elsinore. And there's a real yeah. Lake Elsinore in California, but it's, that's another... Hamlet yeah, thing. That's and the, the football team there are called the Melancholy Danes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Shitty yeah. football and, team there. And like we said, there's a Kilgore Trout story where it's to be or not to be. There's a, a yeah. strong Hamlet through line that Vonnegut calls out to. And I wonder if that was, like, to me, the top of the mind thing you scan from Hamlet is it's about indecisiveness, right? Or if someone alludes to Hamlet, I'm trying to compare it. I'm usually trying to be like, oh, they're trying to say that character has indecision right but i don't think elliot has a lot of indecision it made me wonder if kurt is saying that this novel is about all of my conflicting feelings about empathy yeah for the purposeless in life but we're getting ahead of ourselves <laughs> from a plot perspective he pulls a bokanon and he proudly tells sylvia oh i finally found my destiny and he, yeah. he says my destiny is to go home home is rosewater county indiana named after his family, who right. owns, at this point, the foundation owns almost all the land in Rosewater County. Yeah. And he's like, duh, how could I not have thought of it? I'm supposed to live in the economically downtrodden county I'm named after and make it a utopia. He wants to turn that county into a nice place yeah. and help all the people. And it's shocking to everyone in his family because, in particular with Lister being a senator, the connection to Rosewater, Indiana has always been sort of nominal and sort of a public relations thing. They go say. on vacation there like once every two years for a week. Yeah. And there's a great quote later where the senator says, and every time we went, I told him, this is your home, boy. This is your family home. But I never thought he'd be dumb enough to believe me. <laughs> <laughs> so he moves to Rosewater County, which has become like a shitty Flint, Michigan bust town that's yeah. in an economic depression. Right, right. It's just there's one factory that makes saws and it used to employ a few people. But now because of automation, I think the way Vonnegut describes it is that if you could operate a pinball machine, you could operate the entire factory yourself and turn out a whole you bunch of You just read saws. the manual and press the buttons and yeah. the saws come out. Yeah. And, it, and <laughs> that former, like the high school's mascot is the fighting saw makers. And it's just that's nominally what they do in that county. But essentially they do nothing there now because of automation and because they just haven't found a use for the place and a use for the people. He loves stupid local sports team names he does I, that a lot i super love that in real Me too. life it's the best because i didn't <laughs> i've never been other than when we were filming kill me now our feature 
when I was in Il- Illinois for a while, the two football teams there were the Flaming Hearts and the Wooden Clogs. Really? And I was like, that's lame. <laughs> but I had not been exposed to that. So I guess, yeah, that's an American epidemic. High school yeah. football team names are terrible. There's actually, if you're from yeah. Europe listening to this or anywhere outside, you might not know. Yeah. It's not like football club Barcelona, like <laughs> makes sense. <laughs> it's right. like the melancholy Danes. Yeah. It's something stupid. Yeah, American sports, we have to give it a mascot. And it's always, mm. there's another part of Illinois where their mascot is the pretzels. There's and Just shut up. Also, whenever anybody <laughs> in my life is like considering going to a school, like a college or something, I tend to end up Googling like so and it was looking at UCSD and mm. I was like, hey, the Tritons, how about that? Hey, how about that? Right? <laughs> so I'm just like I'm fundamentally curious about that in a way that doesn't make sense. What do you mean curious it? about it? Because I know the whole deal with it. Okay. Obviously now they go with the whole like Triton as the god of the sea thing. Yeah. But it was originally the Tritons. Because what? UCSD is where they discovered, and I'm going to be fucking up science here by paraphrasing too much, but it's the first place they made an atom that had either three electrons or a charge of three, oh. or, or it had three neutrons. I think it's that it had three neutrons in the nucleus. Anyway, it's an atom of hydrogen <laughs> called a triton. <laughs> and they, the mascot was originally like oh, an man. atom with three neutrons in the nucleus. Oh, that's so much better. <laughs> and, they, and they were like, no one's going to come here. So they changed it to the god of the sea, Triton. Oh, I, yeah. oh, I'm the one person who wants it to I be wish that it was the Tritons. <laughs> we are the Tritons. Yeah, because yeah, you got the whole Simpsons connection with the isotopes. It would have been great. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just ridiculous. Like, oh, I went to Syracuse and our mascot is an orange with arms and legs and a face. And it spins its body around when it's excited. <laughs> like, I love it. It's ridiculous. You know, like fun. oranges do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he, he moved, Elliot moves to uh, Rosewater County (laughs) to get us back on track, which he describes in a beautiful line as having carp as big as atomic submarines fattened on the sludge of the sons and grandsons of the pioneers. (laughs) That's what he sees when he looks at Rosewater County. Is it like fertilizer runoff or something, right? Like it's infected the Uh, water. He's describing the Ohio River, which Vonnegut just described as like a fetid sewage thing, and then that's how Elliot immediately describes it to Sylvia. Yeah, that makes sense. Also, the town has a few very curt things, because for one thing, the town of Rosewater itself, the county seat, is very run down. But there's one nice suburb sort of called New Ambrosia, which was a former commune of German settlers. And then the commune got broken up, but they had been really good brewers. And so there's a huge brewing company there. And in, in Kurt's life, his mom's side of the family made a fortune brewing beer in Indianapolis. So that's a thing. Ah, there's and, the connection. So, it's yeah, it's one of the last remaining businesses in town besides the saw factory is the brewer. Yeah, yeah. And then... Which uh, is only notable because the bottles are printed with a label that shows a painting of the utopia that they expected Rosewater to be built into. Elliot, who's an alcoholic, obviously drinks a lot of this beer and is literally drunk on the dream of forming a society that functions. Yeah, yeah. I love that. Like, he's drinking (laughs) out of a bottle with a utopia painted on the side. He's drunk on the idea of maybe we could have a nice... Maybe we could have a nice place where we could all just relax. (laughs) Right. (laughs) And it won't be terrible. (laughs) Yeah. And yeah, and Elliot sets up shop in the firehouse, right? In a brick Parthenon in the center of town, obviously to mirror the fall of Rome reference from before. Yeah, and it's also a connection to... It's like a mall in the town that's mostly empty in the shape of the Parthenon made of red bricks, which is a stupid thing to make in your town. (laughs) Yeah, well, and it's also a connection to... In Indianapolis, there's a building called the Athenaeum now. It used to be the German-American Hall, and it was designed by Kurt's grandfather, who was an architect. And so he even builds that into... (laughs) (laughs) It's supposed to be run down forgotten part of america and then also it has all these vibes of kurt's actual indianapolis all rolled into one place which is sort of a curious thing and elliot basically paints in gold on all the windows and the door rosewater foundation how can we help you and he sets up uh two phones a red phone and a black phone when the red phone rings there's a fire because he's also the president of the local volunteer fire department because why wouldn't he be he loves it yeah and then when the black phone rings it's someone calling the public number 
and he'll just answer and do anything he can to help you. The yeah. end. Any time of day or night. And basically, they describe a little bit how the town takes to him. Obviously, the downtrodden people enjoy his presence. But I love that they say that at first, the rich people in the town enjoy that he snubs them and is rude to them. And he's constantly rude to rich people. They mention earlier in the book that he has alienated all of his friends and well-wishers right. because he hates rich people and he hates himself and he hates wealth. <laughs> so he's rude to rich people and artists and people in the sciences because he thinks they're all bullshit. <laughs> right. <laughs> so the people in Rosewater at first think he's being rude to them because he's so much richer than them. Right. And they admire that because it reinforces their idea that there's a social ladder they can climb and it's okay for him to be rude for that reason. Mm -hmm. Then when they see him helping really poor people or like giving food and money to the crazy bag lady who wanders around downtown. Yeah. They hate his guts because <laughs> now he thinks they're better than them and he's helping the poor people. You know, it's like yeah. a judgment call now. <laughs> so he is a friend to the poor hated by the wealthy and becomes basically the go-to welfare office in town. I want to say, yeah, anyone can call them and he'll do anything. He becomes a notary public. He'll fill out legal paperwork for you. He'll just write you a check. Yeah. He'll go grocery shopping with you if you're scared or a very old person. He does anything you need him to do. Yeah, and he'll spend as much time on the phone with you as you need. He will prescribe, take an aspirin and have a glass of wine. And it's Vonnegut sort of a simple... Aspirin. He so loves aspirin. aspirin. So many books about aspirin. And it's such a simple fix, but it seems to work. Yeah. He says, hey, it helps in the way it does, you know. And as Vonnegut says of the town... Yahooism, drinking, cuckolding, and self-esteem all took sharp upturns. <laughs> <laughs> Which the rich people hate and the poor people like. And then it cuts back to the legal proceedings. Yeah. Where we've now included Sylvia. Sylvia, the wife, has come yeah. to meet with Norman Mushari, who is just there to take notes as the legal assistant to McAllister, who is her actual lawyer. Yeah, he's the head of the and the senior partner in the law firm that takes care of the Rosewater Foundation and handles them. Yeah, and she comes back to discuss everything with them and figure out what's going to happen from here because she's been released from the mental institution. Yeah. And uh, there's discussion of Elliot and she divorcing officially, even right. though they've been separated but for a long time. She has been diagnosed by the therapist with Samaritrophia. Yeah. Obviously from Good Samaritan and Atrophy. Yeah. Which is defined as an hysterical indifference to the troubles of those less fortunate than yourself. Yeah. So she is apparently medically incapable of caring about poor people <laughs> well, the way that Elliot is. Yes. Now yeah. explain why I'm wrong. My sense of it is that she does care the amount maybe a normal person does or a little less, but Elliot just blew out her ability to do it. Like it's a blown fuse, you know? And I think his example of truly universal love, he loves he doesn't care about the stinky, half-literate homeless person who wanders in. He yeah. treats them like an honored guest. She, f for whatever reason, probably <laughs> the normal reasons of like not being raised to deal with that, felt empathy for that person, but also disgusted by them, and then felt intense self-loathing because like, how come Elliot can be like Jesus and I can't be like Jesus? Yeah. And so in order to protect herself, they imply, she develops this hysterical indifference to... Like, she just can't even think about people yeah. who are less, uh, less fortunate. She's like, fuck those people <laughs> for medical reasons. <laughs> I cannot think about their plight. <laughs> yeah. And so there, she's meeting the main players are her and the father, Lister, the senator. Yeah. They're meeting to discuss what the hell is Elliot doing? What do we do? Right. Should you guys get divorced? It's to, like, manage their lives, basically. Yeah, there's like some kind of legal fix and also it's more of a legal proceeding than taking care of each other but sort of all rolled into one in this meeting with McAllister. She constantly defends Elliot and says that it's admirable and laudable obviously to help poor people. Lister says no it's not and I guarantee you the only reason he can even stand those people is because he's drunk all the time. If he wasn't drunk all the time he would be as disgusted by the common man as I am. <laughs> <laughs> and I want my son back. I wish he wasn't an alcoholic, bleeding heart liberal. I miss my son. Yeah. And she's like, you don't understand. He's a great guy. And he's like, you don't understand. He's a piece of shit. <laughs> yeah, because she's grown to hate herself because she can't achieve what he does in terms of caring for people. And then Lister hates Elliot 
for making Sylvia hate herself, and also because he feels that he's put Elliot in a position where, I'm paraphrasing, but he says that Elliot could have just gone ahead and been the president. Right. He could have been anything he wanted to in the world if he just decided to, but instead he's drinking himself into a coma and helping out these bums. Yes, whereas they cut back to Elliot, who's just doing shit like helping the homeless person get groceries. Yeah. And they just describes him sleeping like a baby. Everyone else is crazy and full of agita. And he's, he's doing what he wants with his life. And I will note that he's described as six foot three, 230 pounds, which my, are my exact measurements. <laughs> oh, really? I am Elliot Roselard. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> so, yeah, from there on, the book gets into describing the people he actually helps. And I think spends a lot of time and effort humanizing them, taking these people that are the dispossessed. They're the people that Vonnegut, and again, I don't fully agree with him that it is this way, but the way Vonnegut sees it is automation comes and takes away your job. Yeah. You become a purposeless human. That's the bottom rung of society. And Elliot's going to help those people. And Vonnegut yeah. tries to humanize them by showing the relationship Elliot has with some of them, which is lovely. Uh, like the long interlude that I think we should talk about with Diana Moon Glampers. She's scared of the thunder is why she calls and he calms her down. Yeah. She's like a simple-minded elderly woman whose whole life has been hard. Right. She's had a real precious of it as far <laughs> as runs go. Right. Like she was born with bad kidney disease. She's not smart or attractive. We'll get to Vana what, but he does love describing just like dumb, ugly women. Yeah. He does it to men too, but not yeah. as much. He right. really okay. likes the image of a dumb, ugly broad. And, yeah. um, <laughs> well, because also I think in this book, he not just is treating the Rosewater, Indiana townsfolk as people who have been displaced by automation. He's also talking about them as people who just have crummy lives right. from jump. Like no matter what, they'd be screwed. Well, and I think we'll get to debating that in the meat, but yeah, I think that's what he's basically presenting the reader because yeah. You're cutting back and forth from Lister and Sylvia having a very intellectual debate about liberalism versus fiscal conservatism or the free market. Yeah. And you're intercutting that with showing what Elliot's life is actually like, including, which I think is really interesting, that some of the people he helps and has helped over and over and over really with an open heart and done nothing but be nice to them, yeah. uh, you know, are annoying or resent him, like yeah. hate his guts even though he helps them because there's people like that. They've heard rumors that he's going to go back to New York or I forget where, but they heard rumors of the impending divorce and stuff and they've heard that he's going to leave town and some of the people resent that he came and improved their lives because now he's going to leave. Yeah. Uh, so I think Vonnegut really does present both like, look, I'm not saying he's Jesus and everything's good, he helps these people, and then these people still live worthless lives and die and are forgotten. It's up to you to decide. <laughs> is it better for the plutocrat to keep all his money, or is it better to help the poor useless person, even if they're useless? And he goes out of his way to make Elliot help people who are as useless as possible. Right. Like, Vonnegut does not believe in the sanctity of, like, everyone has something to give. No, he believes there are people who are born dumb and ugly and like won't find love. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> At most what they could give is to like be nice to their family members and they'll have that kind of love or whatever and that has value, but their life will largely be a waste of everyone's time. Is it noble to love that person and help that person and think that person is important to yeah. treat like a human being? Is it? That's <laughs> for you the reader to decide yeah <laughs> and it is it's also an interesting thing where he like you mentioned about people being mad that he would have fixed their lives at all if he's going to ever leave he does kind of blow people out with his kindness like as the the story goes on they do they have a story of elliot finding a poet named arthur garvey ohm and he goes to ohm and he says great i'm your patron now go write about truth and ohm is like cool, man. So like, what are you into? Obviously, what do you want me to write about? As your he patron? obviously just wants to write what he's paid to write about. Yeah. yeah. And Elliot says, truth. And Ohm's like, oh, great. And they're at a party. So Ohm goes around the party and tries to ask other people, like, like what, what is what Elliot, Elliot want me to like? write about? Yeah. Really? And then it seems to drive Ohm insane, but also Ohm sums, Ohm some poems occasionally and says, and it thanks him for making him insane, essentially. Yeah. Well, Elliot basically does his classic trick of cutting him down to size because he says, like, it's at a, a release of one of his poetry books, and he's very highly respected or whatever. Yeah. And Elliot says, I'll be your patron. And he says, well, what's your favorite poem? And he says, 
thing I saw on the bathroom wall once. It said, <laughs> we don't piss in your ashtray, so don't put your cigarettes in our urinals. And it makes him cry and run away. And then years later, he sends him a book with a cover letter saying, thank you, you being rude. At first, I thought you were just being rude. Then I realized what you meant was most people who seek truth are really just slaves to money and writing what their patron wants. Yeah. Money is bullshit. A lot of things are bullshit. And you're like, yeah, he did mean that. Good job. And Ohm says, so I've written a novel that will change the world and will like make the man bend over and weep or like, you know, <laughs> kneel and suffer. Like he says, you know, the system is not going to be, it's, you're going to love it, dude. It destroys everything. Here's what you patronized. Finally, it's his 800 page book. And he opens it up and chapter one is just a point of view description of raping a girl. And he's like... Yeah, I love that moment because it's like uh, hostile is a thing, but it's like saying hostile is important and provocative oh. because it has a guy's balls getting cut off with hedge trimmers. And you're like, no, it's not. It's just really impactful. And as Elliot says, I have a hard time believing that the Wall Street billionaires who control your lives care that you rape a poor woman. Like even if the book were real, he says, like, I don't think this is the kind of thing that the man cares about. The Pharisees will not gnash their teeth. You're just a shock jock. <laughs> and that's a great interlude. I just like that a lot. And he helps a guy uh, who wants to commit suicide by yeah. saying, how much money would it take you to live one more day? Like, I'll just hire you to live one more day because I'm really tired. It's the middle of the night. Like, and he's like, I don't know, $10,000. And he's like, I'll write you a check for 100 bucks. <laughs> and the guy's like, okay, I won't kill myself. So he pays that guy 100 bucks a day to never kill himself. Yeah. Shit like that. All these charming things that humanize these quote-unquote worthless people. Yeah, and then from there it progresses through helping a lot more people like that and also Mashari continuing to research him. Trying uh, to build a case that he's insane. Yeah. Uh, we should probably hop to the Fred Rosewater branch of the family, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, Elliot gives... Lister a speech about the Money River that there's more talk. I'm about. gonna blurt that Money River yeah, section so for we'll sure, that, so yeah. we can skip it for now. So uh, yeah, the book jumps to because throughout the process of Mushari's goal of I'm gonna prove that Elliot is insane because then I can move the money. The money would move to the other branch of the Rosewater family, which we'll later learn is descended from the other Rosewater brother from way back. George, when. the one who got screwed over. Yeah. yeah. Noah founded this powerful family of tycoons. And then George, through a lot of travails and tribulations, ends up founding a small group of Rosewaters in Rhode Island. It's funny because, and obviously that's the point, for no reason other than dumb luck, Again, I compare a lot of shit to this because it's one of my favorite movies, but it's like No Country where he gets hit by the car, but he survives. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. George also later on became a multimillionaire because of brooms. He had a broom fortune. Yeah. And then he squandered it and shot himself in the head. Right. So <laughs> when Fred is born, he also is descended from millionaires, but it has not. A, it doesn't matter. He's poor and he was born poor. Right. But technically, <laughs> there was a point at which they were just as rich as the other Rosewaters. So it's just, I think the whole point is money, the money river. Money comes and goes because of single deals and luck and all this shit. Yeah, and just sort of random happenstance. Um, yeah, so now he... By the way, the title of the book, God Bless You, Mr. Rosewater, is based on what I'm about to say now, which is... Diana Moon Glampers, when he talks her through the night of the thunderstorm and makes her feel loved, she says, God bless you, Mr. Rosewater. And yeah. right now, when we meet Fred Rosewater, he, it turns out, is a life insurance salesman, which is, of course, one of the more morbid, depressing things that a lower middle class person can have to do for a living. Yeah. And, and he, every, yeah. we should say he's also the specific Rosewater that will get the money next if Elliot He's the one that Mushari, the yeah. Mushari has targeted him as the one who would be the heir and who will give him a cut of the money. Yeah. Yeah. So Mushari in the future is planning to screw him over. He is in the business of trying to screw people over <laughs> by <laughs> depressing them. He hangs out at the diner and anyone who eats there, he just basically depresses them into buying life insurance, you know, tells them that they're more, worth more dead than alive and yeah. they're brides. How can you not support your bride? He uses the word bride to mean wife always. Yeah. He's like, your beautiful bride deserves to be taken <laughs> care of. And the chapter ends with him saying, you know, what my happiest moment ever is 
when a widow comes up to me and says, thank you, because now we have money for the funeral. God bless you, Mr. Rosewater. Yeah. And uh, you're like, <laughs> no, they don't. That's never happened. <laughs> That's right. just part of your sales spiel. Yeah. So he's the sad, leech-like member of the Rosewaters. Yeah. He's Elliot's foil. And he, uh, he lives in, it's called Ponnet, Rhode Island, but the locals who don't like it pronounce it Pionet. And, it's and a, I pronounce it Pisquantuit because that's how it's spelled. <laughs> yeah, I wa- yeah, I want to call it that. It's The book yeah. says it's the specific, Peonic. but it's one of those long Native American New England names. And you follow Fred sort of through the day-to-day of his life. You find out that his wife, who he's always describing in his insurance pitch spiel about how much they love each other, doesn't really care for him. And she has a best friend named Amanita Buntline, who's the wife but also a lesbian kurt keeps saying but is the wife in the very very wealthy buntline family who just sit around earning money in rhode island and are sort of the local i suppose the the local yeah. pawn at rumford's What's or rosewater's the name of fred's wife fred's wife is cynthia cynthia and it's implied or he says cynthia flirts with the idea of lesbianism but she's not really a lesbian she's just trying to be whatever that woman wants her to be. Yeah. She's the ultimate, like, she'll be anything to please her rich friend because hopefully one day she'll teach her how to be rich. <laughs> right, yeah. So and she's basically the pet of this horrible rich woman, Lavinia Funline, <laughs> who's the richest person who happens to be in the town and just goes around having lavish lunches and treating her poor friend like shit because yeah, she knows yeah. she can. And you also meet the daughter of the Buntline family named Lila, she is unhappy with her parents, but she's also a super enterprising kid, and she buys up every dirty paperback she can from the local shop. And in the process of that, we come across another Kilgore Trout novel called Venus on the Half Shell, which I think of as sort of a parody of Sirens of Titan. Like, mm-hmm. if it's Sirens of Titan if Sirens of Titan had no merit, yeah. and it was it's just Flesh like an outer space... Se- the right. porn parody of Flash Gordon. <laughs> yeah, basically. I think that's where we get into the lunch scene where Lavinia and Cynthia are having lunch at a very fancy restaurant. Yeah. And again, we get this idea that's very... Kurt uses it a lot in this book, of intercut scenes that comment on each other. Yeah. So Lavinia and Cynthia are having... Possibly the most uncomfortable lunch ever. Like, everything's such a backhanded compliment, and there's so much self-recrimination and people feeling like status is important and people feeling like they're worthless. Yeah. It's a really a terrible, depressing scene because also you have the maitre d' who owns the fancy restaurant is a gay dude who comes over and is like... Feels weird because at this time, obviously, it's not super acceptable to be gay, but he's rich, so people overlook it. He's also a mean person, so he says shitty things to Lavinia. They do that thing like the family in Arrested Development where you say nice things, but they're obviously really mean things. (laughs) Like, uh, you know, Lucille yeah, talking to her very, daughter. It's very much Lucille eating out at yeah, Skip, exactly. Spread, or Skip Churches or whatever. It is, yeah. <laughs> if I wanted something your thumb had touched, I would have ordered the inside of your ear. <laughs> so they're doing that shit. And meanwhile, the reason this restaurant's so fancy is because it has these giant bay windows that look out on the bay. Yeah. And in the bay, you get this, like, local guy and his two sons catching a bunch of fish and clubbing them to death. And it describes how intimately fulfilling that is. Again, this is the thing where Kurt and I differ. I get what he's saying. He's like working the land is more fulfilling than being a rich asshole. I agree with that. But I thought it was funny that he was like, and they killed and killed and killed the fish. And they felt like real people with real jobs with a real purpose. Yeah. And I get, I know it's hypocritical of me again to say is a carnivore, but I'm like, I don't know if it has to be taking a life that makes you feel alive, but yeah, yeah. could be tilling the soil, climbing a mountain, anything, it's forming a foundation that helps the poor in your community. That's a great yeah. one. Uh, also, but in this case, they're mirroring the fakeness of a rich seafood lunch with the realness of the very poor people who actually harvest the fish that the rich people are eating. Yeah, I do feel he a little bit over idealizes the working the land aspect That's and so I, on, but he does undercut Luddite, it man. right away, so... He thinks that technology is bad and that working the land is good. And I agree in some regards, but Kurt does come off by the end of his whole canon as someone where I'd be like, just a little bit, like, 
lighten up, Grandpa. <laughs> like, I'm sure he would hate texting. He'd be one of these people who are like, millennials are the worst generation ever. And they're not. They just have technology that moves at a speed that you're uncomfortable with. Right. There's bad aspects to it, but it's not intrinsically bad. But he thinks it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> people who kill fish, those are the good people. <laughs> yeah. And also this scene of, oh, real fishermen and crummy fish lunchers, he then undercuts it with, the owner of the restaurant, whose name is Bunny Weeks, says, yeah, I'm friends with the guy who runs the bank. And I know from being friends with the bank that those guys in the fishing boat are broke. They're about yeah. to go bankrupt. They're yeah. screwed. The people doing that run out of money and, and eventually lose aren't able time. to even do that yeah. anymore. Yeah. And us having the lunches, we do great. Uh, We're fine. Kurt Vonna, what aside, you have a character whose main attribute is that they're gay and you name them Bunny. First name Bunny. Last name Weeks. Yeah, yeah, it's not great. <laughs> not great. Moving on. <laughs> not like he's portrayed as a flamboyantly gay stereotype or anything. I just think the name is stupid. Yeah. But uh, basically the way things come to a head is Elliot's helping more and more people enduring the sort of psychic stress of that seemingly perfectly. Like he acts like an angelic person all the time other than the fact that he drinks constantly yeah. and is a freaking weirdo. Right. In the way that I think most people, if Jesus came down and started acting like Jesus but didn't have a halo, you'd be like, who's this weird guy acting really weird, you know? <laughs> like the, uh, the guy says of Sylvia is unable to have empathy. The therapist says, of course, I could have done like hypnotic exercises to let her hear her conscience again. But I realized that I didn't need to cure her because she already is cured. Sad as I am to admit it, in my estimation, a very highly functioning person in today's society living at the upper echelons of society hears their conscience very little. Right. So he was saying she fits in with her rich peers much better now that she has no conscience. So why would I change her back to having a conscience? Like uh, everyone's insane. So if she remains insane, she can continue. Exactly. To she fits in better with society. So basically they get her to call Elliot and convince him to leave Rosewater County for the first time in years to meet with her at the Bluebird Room, which is someplace they had a date. I forget. I don't care. It's in Indianapolis. They never end up meeting there, so yeah. it doesn't matter. <laughs> but to discuss the divorce proceedings and figure it out. Right, right. It's clear that this is one of the first things in a long time that has penetrated his fog of self-righteousness. He's sad that his wife is leaving him. He loves her. Yeah. She loves him. She can't handle his lifestyle. He sees why. It's a sad moment. Everyone's sad, but they're not mad at each other, and they're probably going to get divorced. Yeah, yeah. Now. And we also, plot-wise, we round out the pawn at Rhode Island section with Fred having just this bummer of a day. They also keep saying that Fred is the son of a parent who committed suicide and has always felt that yeah. he, too, will the commit suicide The guy that lost the broom point. fortune and killed himself is his dad. Isn't that further back in the... No, no, because it oh. goes down. They do the same thing where they track the whole bunt line thing. Oh, right. And the, the one that loses eventually is... loses the fortune right. and kills himself is his dad. Fred's yeah, that's dad. right. Yeah. yeah. And so Fred comes home, finds that Caroline still doesn't care about him, but he has for a long time been avoiding reading a biography of the Rosewater family to learn more about their backstory. And when he reads it, we learn about George Rosewater setting yes, up this side the of the stuff family. stuff we already told person. you. Yeah. And Fred finally reads this. Then he makes Caroline read it. Because it gives him such self-esteem and a yeah. feeling of connection. It's so funny. And for the first time, Caroline's sort of impressed with him. And then Fred's thought is, great, I pulled that off. Now to kill myself down here. My little son right. isn't around He's to like... see me do it. It's like, I have finally had one proud moment ever now to die let's, let's go out on top because he knows that the next moments are going to go back to being terrible yeah exactly <laughs> and, and so well get out on a laugh line and he's about to hang himself in his basement and then norman mashari shows up and says hey all the things we as the reader know you're the heir of this fortune if we can prove that elliot's insane and fred faints and, and yeah. all the stuff we told you about all the eccentric shit elliot's doing i have a big fat file that i think proves he's insane the proof that he's insane is that he has a conscience Mm -hmm. which is, of course, the satirical aspect of the novel. Yeah. He faints, cut back to Elliot, who I'm going to race through this, even though it's a long scene, because it's mostly blurts, which we'll get to. But his dad, Lister, takes the phone, talks to him. They have a, a real good, you never understood me, dad. Well, you're a disappointment as a son shouting match, yeah. where Lister does a bunch of good blurts that we'll say some of about why free enterprise is good. Elliot tries to explain why he's doing what he's doing. And I want to say one blur just in here is he says, 
at the end, like, I don't know why we're fighting. I really love you, Dad. I just, I love you, Father. And he says, you know what you are? You're the guy on the street corner with I love you written on every square on a roll of toilet paper, giving a square toilet paper that says I love you. It's like the free hugs person you see at events. <laughs> to anyone passing by, no matter who they are, it could be Hitler. You would say, give him a square piece of toilet paper that says I love you. Yeah. And he goes, yeah, I would. It's unconditional love. And he's like, I don't want my toilet paper. And he's like... I didn't know that my love was toilet paper. <laughs> that's, that's such a good line. So yeah. things aren't good between them. And the senator ends up flying out to personally, like, take him in hand and bring him back to the city to deal with this shit that's happening, especially right. after he finds out they're under attack by Norman Mushari, who has left the firm and is now the sole representative of Fred Rosewater. Yeah, because McAllister and Lister and all them don't know that Mashari is doing this. He's just working as McAllister's right. assistant. So he used his access to all the Rosewater files to build a really airtight case that Elliot's insane. Yeah. That's how he, he got all that stuff. Quits the firm and tries to take them down right away. Yeah, and that becomes the climactic question of the novel, just as far as the plot is concerned. Right. Really, I was much more concerned about who's going to end up happy, who's going to end up sad, what is fulfillment. Did Elliot find fulfillment? Yeah. But on a screenwriting level, <laughs> it's will the Rosewater Foundation transition to Fred or not? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Senator comes to take Elliot in hand. They have yet another scene that's basically two viewpoints arguing about what is moral, what is not. Lister makes all the arguments you th you'd think he make. If you f give a poor person free money, it just makes them want more free money. Right. Elliot says, well, what's so wrong with that if I have all the money and I didn't earn it? Shouldn't they get it for free? They, I didn't earn this money. Who gives a shit? And then it ends with Elliot, who's naked the whole time, yeah. which Vonnegut treats like normal. And maybe it's a, t a generational thing. To be naked as an adult man in front of your dad is not a big deal, I guess. It would be for me. Yeah, that would be strange. Yeah. <laughs> they don't act like that's crazy. But what they do li act like is crazy is he unravels one of his pubic hairs. And it turns out it's a foot long. Which, A, I'm going to call medical bullshit on that. Yep. That's, that can't happen. Don't buy it. But he looks at his father, it says, as if, like, amazed and proud, as if to say, like, whoa, check out this long <laughs> pubic hair. His dad, who hates pubic hair so much that he has a law passed right. with his name on it that identifies pornography as anything featuring bodily hair, which is code for pubic hair. Yeah. Or so it's his most hated thing, <laughs> pubic hair. It's his kryptonite. Yeah, and it's also, <laughs> Vonnegut makes it clear that it's his father's chief achievement in the Senate. Is, this is that he passed the obscenity <laughs> law defining that, like, oh, if on the cover of the magazine a little pube is sticking out from under the bathing suit, that's porn. Yeah. yeah, that's his main <laughs> that's thing his in government. That's his contribution to society, yeah. <laughs> and uh, from there, as Lister and Elliot are fighting, the main th worst thing that Lister says to Elliot is, if you love people so much, why did you turn Sylvia into this broken person, right? Like, by loving everyone, you haven't actually given love to the most important people in your life. And, and you hate them. me. I'm right. your father, and maybe I was a shitty dad, but you're a shitty son. All you've done is make my life painful. Are you saying that it was noble to do that? The point he makes that I found hard to argue with was, yeah, I love my family more than I love strangers. Does yeah. that make me guilty of discrimination? Like, is that a sin to you? I save extra love for my loved ones. Right. <laughs> and yeah. Elliot's like, well, I don't. <laughs> when, and Well, I think the point about Sylvia within that does get to him to some extent because Elliot just sort of freezes up and he reawakens he pulls the mother later night. on he becomes comatose yeah. yeah and then just reawakens full of life again and just having blocked out essentially that experience his brain and, does not record the memory yeah <laughs> yeah and so then he packs up to go to indianapolis to meet up with sylvia the whole town freaks out because they think he's leaving forever he says no i'm not but they're like yes you are and it they have really that. reminded me of like they say someone who knows they're about to commit suicide or going to an, their execution because they describe his brain blocks the memory but all he remembers is he has to get on the train at this time yeah. And he's not worried about it, and he's very calm and cheerful. And he goes out, and people are like, you're leaving us forever. And he's like, I don't know what you're referencing, but I have to make my train. Yeah. Like, he is intentionally, he's sawed the gears off, the teeth <laughs> off his gears a bit. Yeah. He's crazy now. He really is crazy by the end. Oh, for sure, yeah. At least arguably crazy, legally crazy. And the process of his trip, he, like, picks up a few more Kilgore Trout stories, which are interesting. And then he gets on the bus, to, or train or bus, I forget which, goes to Indianapolis, 
And he, on the way, he's they're pulling in toward Indianapolis, and he looks at the city, and he's like, oh, that's interesting, because the city is consumed in a firestorm. All of Indianapolis yeah. is under a column of flame and just burning. Which is not real. And not, he's having apocalyptic Because vision. then everything goes black. Yeah. And also, when Elliot sees the firestorm, he remembers a book he read about the firebombing of Dresden, which is and then the most Vonnegut thing in the world. And he, in a detached <laughs> way, is like, this probably isn't real then, because the people around me aren't reacting like it's real. Right. And then he blacks out. Yeah. And then he wakes up, and it's like six months later, I think. <laughs> yeah. And so he wakes up in a mental hospital garden, but it's not like he wakes up in bed. He wakes up sitting there in a tennis outfit, sitting ready up. to play tennis. Holding a racket yeah. with, like, sweatband on his forehead, ready yeah. to play tennis. Yeah. And having <laughs> lost a bunch of weight. So clearly he's just been completely comatose, but alive and doing stuff in this mental hospital, right. being recuperated and rehabilitated. And lo and behold, the people sitting there around him are his father. That makes sense. His yeah. therapist. Okay. And Kilgore Trout, for some reason. <laughs> and McAllister the Lawyer. But that's and McAllister yeah. the Lawyer, of course, who's there to yeah. just help out. What becomes revealed is that basically while he was in this comatose suggestible state that has come from things reaching ahead of like, am I a good person? Am I a bad person? I can't handle anything. Shut down. So he just shut down. Yeah. They have been grooming him for the impending trial that will decide whether their family loses all its money. Right. So they made him lose weight, play tennis so that tabloids can get pictures of him playing tennis and looking cheerful and all this shit. And they've been grooming him for what he's going to say on the stand. And his therapist is there as an expert witness to say why he's sane. And they also asked, he's like, well, why is Kilgore Trout here? And they're like, don't you remember? You insisted that we find this sci-fi writer you like and bring him out here. Right. And it turned out he was working a shitty job and we offered him $100,000. So here he is. Yeah. Which I'm... is, of course, a nod to how Kurt had to struggle, uh, even though he's a, <laughs> he knows he's a genius, right. but he had to struggle anyway. When, and also they hired Kilgore Trout specifically to write the rationale for everything Elliot did. So then Kilgore Trout sums up all of the, the meaning and intent behind all of the things Elliot has done throughout it's the book. And really it's really fourth of, Wally. If Vonnegut yeah. goes like, now Kilgore Trout, who loosely is me, right. will explain what Elliot was doing and why and put it in context. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so then Trout explains all of this and they say, well, great. Elliot looks healthy. He's going to be fine. He'll prove he's not insane by just mm -hmm. going on the stand and looking and good repeating and what you stuff. just said right. and i think it's important to point out elliot hears everything trout is saying and goes like thanks man you just said in real words what i was trying to do and you're a great writer so you were able to elucidate it wow yeah whereas lister thinks <laughs> man you writers it's crazy how you can bend words to make even crazy nonsense sound believable right. i'm so glad we hired this crazy bastard right. this is so crazy it just might work and what he's saying is like no don't you see Elliot is sane because he believes that human beings have dignity. And Lister is like, ha ha, yeah, that's the stuff. That's the crazy <laughs> nonsense we paid you for. Good job. Yeah. I think at one point Lister even says Trout could get a great job in PR, He's which like, is yeah. funny in the context of Vonnegut's actual yeah. life where he worked in PR. He's like, oh, yeah, helping people is Christ-like. That's good. That's a that's, good line. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's some good bullshit. Yeah, really yeah. great. And so Elliot hears all this and says, oh, so hang on. I'm the head of the Rosewater Foundation. You, McAllister, the lawyer, have to do whatever I say no matter what, right? And McAllister says, yes. And Elliot says, and if we work out who is my heir, essentially, that also works out the trial, whether or not I'm insane, right? Right. Okay, so the insane deal is, is if Mushari proves he's insane, Fred will get the money if he is the closest male right. Rosewater. Meanwhile, I'm not stealing your punchline thunder, no, but I want to say I feel like you skipped a little part of the setup with just no, sure. that... During the six months in the asylum, yeah. as you'd expect, all kinds of tabloid rumors swirl around the family in the upcoming trial. One of the most notable for the purposes of what Alex is about to say, being that 53 some oh, odd yeah. women come forward saying, my child is the son of Elliot Rosewater. When he was touring the country drunkenly, he knocked me up. They're all lies. It's the anti-Cosby story. They really are just people trying to get rich off of... <laughs> like, we know Elliot did not impregnate any of these women. Yeah, because uh, we, we know for sure that he just stopped having exactly. sex a long time ago. Because, yeah. as his therapist says, all of his sexual energy is focused on forming a utopia. Right. <laughs> so take it <laughs> no, away, Alex, with the ending. That's huge, yeah. So he says, great, I'm just going to drop a document that says my heir is everyone who has said that 
I fathered their child. I will legally admit yeah. I fucked all those women. Because, Anyone who says because his do. team says no, no, no. We did a blood test on the first accusation of this that inspired all the copycats, and they're definitely not related to you. And we can prove it with all the other ones, so you're fine. And he said, no, regardless of blood tests. Anyone who says that their child is my descendant, yeah. that's correct. Distribute all the money evenly between them. And so he just gives In away other words, everything. They're all my sons. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and he also says, and I want to say unto them, be fruitful and multiply. Which is weird because it sets him up as God. But it's a little self-aggrandizing. But also, obviously, the joke or the punchline is this guy who through no decision of his own, was forced to be this node of a ton of resources in society, yeah. finds a clever way to ensure that steadily and steadily and steadily, that money will just get divided and divided and divided until a bunch of average people have an average amount of money. Right. Which is what he wanted in the first place. <laughs> because by the terms of it, even more people can say that they're his Because they're kids. children's children, right. The yeah. money is just going to be divided until it's an insignificant sum, right. but it helped as many people as possible get on their way or have a more pleasant life. Yeah, yeah. And then that's the end of the story. It, it yeah. doesn't end with and then you a go, hanging or a suicide. <laughs> like then you the go and couple. occupy Wall Street. <laughs> oh, we should say, in the interest of wrapping up loose ends, as I said, Sylvia has been consigned to a life in a nunnery. Yeah. <laughs> because that's the best way to get her out of having to testify at the trial. So now she's a nun for legal reasons. <laughs> right. <laughs> and also for Hamlet reasons. Yeah. Yeah. It's a plot that we got into a lot of meaning with it, which is why I think we gave it some time. But it's not super, super crucial. Like, like you said, the ostensible plot is what will happen to the foundation. But it's really about everything else that's going on. And even when the book came out, the New York Times reviewed it in 1965, and the reviewer sort of says, this isn't quite a novel to me. It's more just a string of ideas. It's and a I don't series know if that's of essays. Fair, but yeah. it's, it's getting at something that I think is accurate. It's like a series of thematically linked essays espoused by characters who happen to live in the same town. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> and bounce well, off each other a little bit. Yeah. But it's mainly speeches and interesting speeches <laughs> yeah yeah and, and letters they're, they're reasonably intricately fit together but it's True. all just that it's all one one legal proceeding that's a light framework yeah yeah do you want to get into a next segment which is called kurt blurt blurt is the word b -b -b -blurt. <laughs> yeah. yeah and we hit yeah. a lot of the big ones i think in the process of summing up the book especially that very first line of the whole thing but the first line of the first chapter where a sum of money is a leading character in the tale about people just as a sum of honey might properly be a leading character in a tale about bees i do agree with you that it's a little bit hokey i think he could he could have been less punny but it is such a just yeah this is what's going on this is the thing yeah like it's, it's the clarity is works for me it's it's effective in that way i'll agree yeah. And I'm going to keep the train rolling. <laughs> the one I got is, uh, the first one I got was, well, I just wanted to, because we didn't delve into this scene, but the scene at lunch really is really uncomfortable. Yeah. One of the good ones that will give you some color for that sequence is Bunny comes over and says something really catty to Amanita Buntline. And at the same time has his hand on her shoulder and squeezes it so hard that it hurts her. Intentionally, we are led to believe as like a weird dig. Yeah. Like, you're rich, but I can physically hurt you, which is really <laughs> aggressive for a lunch. Yeah, really um, weird. <laughs> she says, you're hurting me. And he says, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know that was possible. <laughs> and <laughs> she says, good. bastard. And he says, might as well be. <laughs> and then he says of the people who are fishing, that's all over, though. Men working with their hands and backs. They are not needed. Then he points to four stupid, silly, fat widows in furs laughing over a bathroom joke on a paper cocktail napkin. And look who's winning. And look who's won. Oh, man. <laughs> like the game of who gets rich. He's just like, there's a later part where Vonnegut says, like, of the rich people, their lives were just as pointless and worthless and unhappy as the poor people's lives. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> so, yeah, I just think that's a... In the game of who gets all the money, it's like, and the people who win are just people anyway. Like, they don't deserve it any more than anyone. Right. <laughs> yeah. I have a blurt here. I think it kind of connects because it's mm -hmm. about 
sort of how everybody's the same despite their class. It's Lister is back in Rosewater, Indiana, and he's arguing with Delbert Peach, who is a local in Rosewater who's a drunk. And Lister says, Mr. Peach, you probably voted for me. Like, as much as you hate me, you probably just voted for me. And Peach had also said, oh, yeah, I vote all the time. And he's lying. He clearly hasn't. But Peach says, why would I have voted for you? I don't like you. And Lister says, well, do you know why they vote for me? Inside of every American, I don't care how decayed, is a scrawny, twanging old futz like me who hates crooks and weaklings even more than I do. Yeah. It's really and it's really heavy, but it's a pretty neat summation it's to me of totally reminded me of you want the truth, you can't handle the truth. Yeah. And also uh there's a Simpsons line, uh Sideshow Bob. Deep down, you know you need a Republican in <laughs> office to put criminals away, oppress the poor, and rule you as you deserve to be ruled. <laughs> yeah, the idea yeah. that, like, you don't know what's best for you, I know what's best for you. So, yeah. And you agree that I know what's best for you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one of my favorite stories like that is, I forget what the context is. I know it's a real historical story, but it was like an archbishop or a count or a duke <laughs> in, in old-timey times in England let's say the mayor of Nottingham okay. is walking around, right? And he was uh, greatly feared because he was so cruel. And he came up to one of the commoners and is like, you love me, don't you, as your ruler? Do you not love me? And they're like, anything you say, boss, I owe my whole life to you. Of course I would do anything for you. And he's like, and is it because you love me or because you fear me? And they're like, fear, my lord. And supposedly he starts beating them viciously with the staff yelling, Love, you're supposed to love me. Oh, no. <laughs> it's like that is a great metaphor yep. for some politicians that I could name but won't. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and just the whole political ideology. Regardless of my politics, I grew up with the rise of President George W. Bush being sort of the first president mm. I was super conscious of. And I found myself asking, I feel that a lot of these people are voting against their own self interest by voting for this president. Why would they do that? And I feel like that line is a pretty good summation of maybe one reason they would do that. Like maybe right. one reason where they would be like, yeah. I'm aware of everyone lives in a bubble to some degree. So one of the answers could be that we're wrong and they're right and they see right. the truth we don't see. It also could be that. But to me, it does seem like people globally are yeah. voting against yeah, yeah. their own obvious self-interest at an unprecedented rate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> This is not no. my blurt, but she was drunk and full of chicken and mayonnaise. Isn't that how uh, you want to yeah. be? I love that, <laughs> that state great. of being. Was that, that was uh, Cynthia, right? Amanita. Or, or, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cynthia after a lunch, yeah. Is it actually, is it, wait, is it It's Caroline? when he comes home to find Cynthia on the couch, I think, after the lunch. You know and what? And she, like, emasculates We've him. been calling her Cynthia, but it's Caroline. That's my bad. I took your cue, so I'm blaming that yeah, all on you. That's all on me. All right. But my Cynthia actual... is an ancestor of the, the other Rumfords. Anyway. But my actual blurt I want to pull out right now is from Elliot's letter, one of the many rants. When the United States of America, which was meant to be a utopia for all, was less than a century old, Noah Rosewater and a few men like him demonstrated the folly of the founding fathers in one respect. Those sadly recent ancestors had not made it the law of the utopia that the wealth of each citizen should be limited. Yeah. And it's like, oh, dude, I never even thought of that. I'm not trying to take away Warren Buffett's millions. I'm not trying to say we should be socialists and everyone should be the same in a drab gray uniform. Right. But it, let's say the most money you're allowed to have is $1 billion. It's still a hell of a lot, right. but it would change a lot about the world and the way society works. And yeah, it yeah. might be a good idea to have a salary cap for everyone. You had just have an amount of money yeah. that you're allowed to make. And then shortly after that, he's talking about the people who then took that lesson and ran with it, or that loophole and ran with it. They yeah. saw that praise was reserved henceforth for those who devised means of getting paid enormously for committing crimes against which no laws had been passed. It reminded me of Trump at the debates very much with the, <laughs> well, hey, you know, if there's a legal loophole that we both agree is morally reprehensible, and I did it. <laughs> Well, yeah. I'm not the bad guy. You should have not had the loophole for me to take advantage of. Is yeah, very he, much that, like, I would think he would be of one mind with these people that Kurt is describing as like, oh, great, a loophole in the Constitution. Obviously, the most meritorious thing you could do would be to be the person who most takes advantage of that loophole. Because yeah. it's all the game is the game and business is business. 
Yeah, and, <laughs> and, and not to justify him, but he's not the only person who I think has felt that way in history. It's just like he was someone to say it in a national debate. And Absolutely. You're like, oh, yeah. my God. Oh, absolutely. It's, yeah. it's not evil. It's good business if I exploit a loophole, right? Right. And I don't agree with it. But there's, I don't agree that yeah, business yeah. is business. And that he says that in the book, that it's one of the weirdest things people say. Yeah. Is that like, man, that was some cold shit in there. You really like unrepentantly fucked over those third world farmers. Yeah, well, business is business. You want to grab lunch? Yes. <laughs> business is business. Everything evil you do, I guess, is fine because it was business. It doesn't yeah. make any sense. It's like just a mantra to not feel bad about ripping people off. That's actually one of my blurts was George Rosewater, the ancestor who went and fought in the Civil War. He comes back and finds out he's lost everything and people are telling him this. And he's a blind, wounded veteran who has nothing now. And they, they're telling him all this. And he says, well, said George, still smiling, smiling, smiling. As the Bible tells us in no uncertain terms, business is business. Yeah, and I love that in his mind it's so sacrosanct that he mistakenly thinks that's from the Bible. Yeah. Or he knows and he's being facetious. Either way, great. Yeah, and, and the way Kurt phrases it with like the smiling, smiling, smiling. <laughs> yeah. It's just like he's just going to be endlessly fine with this. It's just going to be how it goes. So, as I said, I disagree. One of the Vonnegut themes that comes up a lot is that science is largely bad. Yeah. And, uh, and robots are largely bad. I don't agree. I think he does a good job highlighting the things that are bad about them, but I don't necessarily yeah. agree. He also says several times in this book, and the arts never helped anyone. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Although a curb blurt that I should paraphrase is he says, although what he, Elliot really meant by that is that the arts had never helped him, which you must admit is a fair thing for someone who bayoneted a 14-year-old by accident to think. Like that right. the arts are not really what help in this life. But obviously, as an entertainer, I think the arts are damned important. And one of the few free things that we can do that help each other out through this hard life. So I yeah. disagree there. And I don't even know if Kurt was saying that. But that was just what Ellie was saying. But the blurt is <laughs> <laughs> simply a fact. It's a fact that Elliot briefly was the art purchaser for the Rosewater Foundation. And I love that. And this is a real piece of art. The one piece of art he mentions having purchased was Rembrandt's Aristotle contemplating a bust of Homer. Yeah. And even though I defend art, that is a great example of the ultimate meaningless circle jerk that high art could become. Like, right. it's a bust of Homer who you're supposed to care about because it's important. Because he's nice. He's important. Right. And it's a painting of Aristotle looking at Homer, so it's extra smart. And it was painted by Rembrandt, so right. it's even more important to own. <laughs> like, who gives a shit? It's like saying, oh man, did you see that episode where Ryan Seacrest introduced Carson Daly's like, show about some other person who doesn't do anything and has no talent. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Like yeah, that yeah. host show where they just introduce each other. <laughs> well, even I didn't know that painting and I looked it up and I took meaning from it, but it was all meaning about art, art and about finding meaning. The that only was message of it that. is that art is meaningful, which you already know if you're looking at art. <laughs> Yeah, and like I took some like the difficulty of it, and like, sure. but it's and the lineages, but it's all it's all just it just, is yeah. Uh, like I think Kurt said it one thing about it's a good literature singer. should not disappear up its own asshole. Like it's just art going <laughs> yeah. up its own asshole. Yeah, I think I I think I have two more blurts. How about sure, you? I have four more real fast. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. I'll do, I'll do one, and then... Go. There's one back and forth when Lister and Sylvia and McAllister are meeting. Lister says to Sylvia, may I ask you a highly personal question? And Sylvia says, it's what life does all the time. Nice. It's great. Just phenomenal. Similar, just good writing, but nothing to say about it. When Fred is introduced, his introduction is, he was a portly man, a slop with coffee, gravid with Danish pastry. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> You're done. You don't need any more description. Also, similarly, just a zinger that's great. Elliot took a drink of Southern Comfort, was uncomforted. <laughs> <laughs> Especially because uh, Sylvia calls him her dirty drunk uncle down south, which is oh, what Jen yeah. calls me when we're making love. So I really, that resonated oh, with me. I mean, whatever works for yeah. me, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, give me your last one, and then I'll yeah. do the Money River one. So this is slightly long, but it, this book has, in addition to strong blurts, it might be... Might be Kurt's strongest in terms of very long speeches that have babies? a lot of meaning baked into them. Is it the yeah, speech to the, the babies? babies. Great. Yeah. Now I don't have to do that one. Yeah. <laughs> so it, Elliot is talking about what he would say to the babies on Earth as they enter Earth. Total <laughs> 
And he's sort of saying, oh, I don't know. And then he says, hello, babies. Welcome to Earth. It's hot in the summer and cold in the winter. It's round and wet and crowded. At the outside, babies, you've got about 100 years here. There's only one rule that I know of, babies. God damn it, you've got to be kind. And that's why babies talk like garbage. First <laughs> word they hear is God damn it. That's not okay. <laughs> yeah, break Get some. your potty mouth out of my unborn child's ear, yeah. Kurt Vonnegut. Yeah, yeah. Your yeah. cussing is wrong. No, one of the best speeches ever written in anything. Obviously, yeah. one of my favorite quotes of all time. It's just great. And we should mention, I guess in passing, we skipped just a detail I like is Elliot himself in the story wrote an unfinished novel. About reincarnation. It's the one that I mistakenly said was in Slapstick, although at the time in the first episode I said I could be wrong. It's in this, guys. The novel about how heaven is just like a pool table expanse with a gate on it and everyone's bored as hell and they all just want to be reincarnated because it sucks there. That's in this one, it turns out. It's Elliot's (laughs) book. Okay, my last Kurt blurt is Money River, which is a symbol used th- repeatedly in the book, so we could not bring it up. Yeah. And he does a whole long speech. I'm actually going to skip the length of the... It's a several-page speech. But basically, he just says that in America, we thought it was merit-based, and the harder you work, the more likely you were to make money, and that money translates to happiness, and that therefore happiness would shower down upon the people who worked hard and had pure hearts, and yeah. life would be good and fair and just. That's not how it works, he says. <laughs> the way it works is if you know where Money River is because your dad knows where Money River is, Money River being like Mushari is trying to find, any place right. where you can easily make money without trying hard because you're just willing to take the money. That exists, and anyone who finds Money River, them and their children and their children's children, drink out of the river, and they don't tell poor people where the river is. And it's not merit-based. It's just if you know someone, that's all. And the end of it, here comes the blurt, is he says, and when I'm at a party and one of us claims that there is no such thing as the money river, I think to myself, gosh, but that's a dishonest and tasteless thing to say. (laughs) (laughs) So just the idea that, yeah, you just, to get rich, you just have a rich friend who puts you on the payroll at some cushy job and then your kids are rich because of your money. It's all bullshit (laughs) is the point. Everyone is a victim of a series of accidents, as are we all. And this whole book, I think, Kurt is running into contradictions between that and the way we think about capitalism. Just all of the time. Absolutely. It's the, yeah. It's him muddling around with every possible point of view he could have about the money situation, yeah. including his self-doubts about what he thinks about it. Right, Very interesting right. introspection into And I would say, man, so timely. Obviously, it's going to be al- almost always timely. Yeah. But like, if you uh, are passionate or have a lot of emotions about money and financial distribution in the world or in this country, it's a great one to read. It'll spark a lot of ideas. And yeah. it, even lines of thought you may have not agreed with, you might reconsider. Yeah, for sure. And I'll, another thing but, that's great about it I loved is, more than his other ones, I think, it has a million short stories in it that we weren't able to get to. Like every time they mention a Kilgore Trout story, you get the elevator pitch of the sci-fi hook for that story. And they're all good. Like it really reminded me of A Hundred Years of Solitude, an incredible book where they'll all of a sudden be like, okay, the main thing's happening. Then they're going through the jungle. They're going through the jungle. And they find an ancient pirate ship on land hundreds of miles from any water. And then when they search the dead dry riverbed nearby, all they find is an ancient suit of armor with a locket with hair inside the locket. And then they move on. And you're like, well, what was that about? <laughs> what happened there? It seems like everyone in Rosewater County could have propelled their own book. Like, is that- There's just a lot to pick up if you want to. I might be segueing very well into a recurring characters thing, because is Diana Moon Glampers? Let's get into our next segment oh, called Recurring Characters I'm Update. Excited. Update, 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 update. I set them up. Here they are. You Alex them down. <laughs> so they're, like you say, there's a bunch of them in this one, and one of them is Diana Moon Glampers. And the thing about her is we're going through Kurt's novels chronologically, and also we're going to get to his short stories very soon because of when Welcome to the Monkey House was published. But this is Diana Moon Glamper's second and, as far as I know, last appearance in Vonnegut because she first appeared in Harris and Bergeron, the short story he wrote in 1961. Gotcha. But she was a totally different character in that, in that she's a very cruel 
totalitarian leader. She's the handicapper general of the United States in an America where everyone is handicapped intentionally to keep everyone equal. Interesting that she appears as the most worthless person in this. Yeah. Maybe that's why she's so keen to handicap everyone. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, feel I mean, like... I've read both and it's impossible for it to be the same woman, but you know what I mean? There yeah. There could be some theme stuff there. It's probably why the name came to mind for Kurt right. in, in general. And then, of course, the probably biggest recurring character in all of Vonnegut, Kilgore Trout. Yep. He shows up in this. And he will also come up in Timequake as the main character. He's key character in Breakfast of Champions. Also in those books and in Galapagos, we meet his father and his son, but also there are different versions of his father and different versions of his son in them. He's also a pseudonym for the character who's kind of a Kurt Vonnegut stand-in in Jailbird. So that character okay. is writing books and that one of his one pen names that, is Kilgore yeah. Trout. I haven't read that either. I'm looking forward to it. And then Kurt also calls Trout on the phone in Man Without a Country. There's just, he's all over his work from here on. Yeah, someone yeah. dates a Rumford in one of the life stories. One of the people dated a Rumford. The Rumford's always obliquely yeah. coke in, and, but don't do anything. <laughs> and I also thought one of the great ones for this segment is, he mentions Tralfamador when he's talking to the sci-fi convention authors. Yeah. And it's not, that one I think is more than just a passing reference because he says... Sci-fi authors, you only write about crazy aliens. You don't have to go to Tralfamador to see a crazy alien. Look at this strange creature we call the American Millionaire. Yeah. I yeah. can write a check, and then he does, for $200 for every person in this room, and you can go cash him today. That's crazy. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. But what I love about that is if you'll recall, <laughs> Tralfamador is using an invisible ray to control every aspect of society. So to compare... Rich yeah. people to Tralfamadorians is especially resonant and cool. Right. They use that, an invisible ray to control all of society. Because <laughs> money's the ray. And yeah, yeah, money. That's yeah, amazing. financial influence is the ray. Oh, and, and also with Trout, he is sort of an interesting figure because he's clearly a Kurt stand in a lot of ways and sort of the science fiction element of Kurt's work. And also he. According to, I got a book called The Vonnegut Encyclopedia. It's by Mark Leeds, and it is just cross-referencing and indexing for all of the things in Vonnegut. Mm. And he lists 44 different fictional stories by Kilgore Trout across all of Vonnegut's work. So yeah. that's just constantly Kurt's outlet for all of his science fiction impulses. Do they all exist? Like, have they all been written? No, most Some, of them I are pitches. Some, I assume, are just titles, right? Yeah. yeah, most of them are sort of pitches briefly outlined, like in this book, often. We should start a thing on our Facebook page where we write Kilgore Trout, like what we think they would have been. Just so write Kilgore Trout short stories. And also, speaking of sci-fi writers, as much as Trout is an analog to Vonnegut, Vonnegut says in his letters and in, in life that Trout is based more directly on Theodore Sturgeon, who is a big mm -hmm. sci-fi writer, and who Kurt felt was criminally underappreciated throughout his very prolific career as a sci-fi writer because he wrote a letter to one of Sturgeon's daughters in, where is it here, 1999. If you know what I'm saying. <laughs> so he, he wrote her in 99 and said that, I created a character, Kilgore Trout, an impoverished, uncelebrated science fiction writer who made his debut and got my novel, God Bless You, Mr. Rosewater. Persons alert for wordplay notice that Trout and Theodore Sturgeon were both named for fish and that their uh, first names... You don't names have to be that alert and with catch or, up. They asked me if my friend Ted had been my model for Kilgore. Answer very briefly and in a way. And then Kurt keeps writing her and tells her a story about... Kurt calls it a hate crime that the American literary establishment considered science fiction not good. He calls it genreism. Hate <laughs> crime might be extreme, but that's what he says. But he says that one time Sturgeon visited Kurt's house in West Barnstable, Massachusetts. Sturgeon had clearly been writing without sleeping for days and just looked really haggard and worn out. And then Sturgeon, while he was hanging out, just got up and told everyone, hey, I'm going to do a standing backflip and does it successfully. And then just the way Kurt says it, he landed on his knees with a crash which shook the whole house. When he got back on his feet, humiliated and laughing in agony, one of the best writers in America was indeed, but only for a moment, my model for Kilgore Trout. Beautiful. Yeah. And so it was a good friend of his that he turned into this character. But at the same time, like James Black says in that thesis, and like I think we both say, Kilgore Trout is a Vonnegut stand-in in most like mechanical ways and plot yeah. ways and things like that. And so, yeah, so that's a, a huge recurring character, and we get him all over this book. There's a couple others from there. Norman Mushari actually recurs a little bit, because not just the connection of he builds model airplanes and masturbates, which other characters do in other books, but also Norman Mushari Jr. 
is a character who gets hired as a lawyer in slapstick very briefly. So ah. we off screen, Norman has a son and that becomes a lawyer in the books. The poet Arthur Garvey Ulm from this book reappears in Timequake as a poet and Timequake includes the American Academy of Arts and Letters. So there's a whole bunch of authors wandering around and Arthur Garvey Garvey Ulm is a poet there. And also Kurt says that Ulm physically resembles his real life friend Bernard V. O'Hare. So then Bernard V. O'Hare gets worked Mm -hmm. into Ulm and that's sort of a recurrence of that. And Rhode Island returns, obviously. And then also William Blake's poetry It's not quite a character, (laughs) but we get it in this book and also in a lot of other Kurt works. It already came up in Mother Night. And then in Palm Sunday, he talks about how much he loves William Blake, but also that Kurt's education was in chemistry at Cornell and then anthropology at the University of Chicago. And Kurt says he wasn't really trained in literature and missed out on a lot of great work. And then his biggest example is he was 35 before he saw any of William Blake's stuff. And Mm. can you believe it? He said, yeah, yeah. William who? No, just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> Not that dumb. Yeah. Close, though. One thing I want to say is, especially with Trout being a key part of this book, when we were looking at Cat's Cradle, Kurt in his letters was talking about how he felt kind of pooed out that like Cat's Cradle was the end of a mm-hmm. real big burst of creativity and building things and things like that. And I feel like Trout in this book is the cornerstone of sort of Kurt's next burst of activity. As he's moving on and he's sure, figuting yeah. out sort of what to do next. One this Wampeter is waxing and his other Wampeter is waning. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Wampeter. Sure. Sure. <laughs> Whatever your ignorance forces you to say is fine. <laughs> and I think that also covers another segment we often do called Kurt Cameo. Wow! <laughs> Inception sound at the end. <laughs> yeah, because uh, Kilgore's the Kurt standing in this book, and also, like we talked about before, there's the little bits of Indiana and actual Indianapolis that come up in Rosewater and in the area with the Parthenon and the beer brood there that are very Indianapolis and Kurt's life. So he's still writing himself in as he goes along. So I'm just move? reading the part where he goes, <laughs> Heil Hitler, and he goes, and a Heil Hitler to you, sir, and good day. <laughs> <laughs> when he's like comatose and he's just wandering around the town to get to his train on time. Oh, yeah. He passes a crazy neo Nazi guy and <laughs> just to show that he's dazed and out of it. He's just like, oh, and a Heil Hitler to you, uh, sir. Good yeah. day. All right. I repeat uh, what people say to me on the street. <laughs> I repeat it back at them and smile. <laughs> <laughs> what if we did another segment called Vana What? What, what, what if we, what would you do? If you were Kurt Vonnegut. (laughs) I think we've touched on aspects of this in earlier summarizing the plot. Uh, One thing we keep coming back to is how he writes women. I feel like we're both generally in agreement that he writes some women pretty meanly in this, but also some men pretty meanly in this. And it's he's sort of at the status he was at before where he could do a little better at writing female characters or maybe a lot better. But I feel it's not intrinsically cruel the way he's gone about it. Yeah. Okay, so there's some directors who like casting interesting-looking people instead of what you traditionally get as a Hollywood-looking person. Yeah. And I uh, I like that, and I think Kurt has a fascination with homely people (laughs) or average-looking people in a similar way. But he really, it just seems more on the female side that he's constantly describing people as, like, hideously ugly and then therefore as having nothing to offer. Right. If they're women. <laughs> like, I think uh, when Sylvia has her mental breakdown, her therapist tells her, stop worrying about poor people. You got to get out there and have fun before your looks fade. They're going to be gone soon. Then what will you do? You'll have nothing to offer <laughs> anyone. But yeah, Ivana, what I wanted to shout out that I don't even really count. Because, as was pointed out astutely on the Facebook page, I think, Characters being racist is not necessarily a Vana what you, you know what I mean or yeah. or sexist or anything. That's a good point. It's interpretation of the subtext, and admittedly, we could be wrong about our interpretation. But when I bring up a Vana what, it's because I think it was something where, like, if my grandpa said it, I'd be like. <sighs> Come on, Grandpa, we don't say that anymore. It's 2016. (laughs) So this isn't that. It's just a character being problematic, but I thought it was really funny, which is uh, Sylvia on the phone asks how he's doing and where he is, and he's like, I'm in a bathroom. He loves graffiti on bathroom walls. He's like, you won't believe what I just read. It's really beautiful. And she's like, what's that? And he's like, it says, Sheila Taylor is a cock tease. 
I'm sure it's true. And I'm like, why are you sure it's true? Right. I don't get the second part. The second part is what I don't get. I'm sure it's true. Yeah, really thrown by that. Yeah. Why no? The other maybe Vana what is that he's he does some really negative descriptions of the townspeople in Rosewater. Mm-hmm. I do the more I look at them, I think it's pretty harsh, but also he's not going full on. Uh, let's say the movie Precious with it, like full, out, like there are worse lives than there the one he's, de- ones he's describing. He's just doing them harsh enough to get his point across and not going, you know, not wallowing in just total misery. I think it's one of the things that injects a lot of doubt in it for me, because I think, I think he's so big on how ugly and worthless they are to show that as a human being, who's nice, goddamn it, babies, you should even care about the most worthless possible person you can imagine. But it's a double-edged sword yeah. because it comes off as mean eventually when he's just like, and the poor and homeless really are worthless. They're just useless and worthless and all about to commit suicide because they know they're no good for anything to anyone. And uh, I think... I get his point and where he's coming from in terms of macro trends and society and yeah. people who are forgotten. But I do think, unlike some maybe more emotional writers, he's forgetting the little moments of love between family or, you know, the little nice yeah. moments that make life worth living. It's kind of harsh just to say he introduces many characters who he flat out says like, and almost anyone with reason would agree that it would be better if this person just hung themselves. Yeah. He like says that about people and you're like, I don't know that that's true, <laughs> but he, it's funny because he's saying it because he wants to show how much empathy Elliot has, right? but at the same time, it highlights kind of a lack of empathy on his part. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's even, there's one, uh, there's a point where he's describing a high school boy relatively early in the book and it's through Elliot's voice, but he's watching this high school student in Rosewater walk by and he says he often carries birth control devices in his pocket which many people find alarming and disgusting the same people find it alarming and disgusting that the boy's father did not use birth control devices <laughs> yeah <laughs> just like out of nowhere like everyone is grossed out by his existence yeah it's great. disgusting and it's it's really like you say it's so it's over a the burn. top it's to a make hard the point burn. <laughs> but the burns are there man yeah yeah i thought it was a little weird If it were a friend of mine, I'd be like, really? We should unpack that a little. After he reads the description of the rape in the novel Mm. that he was sent by Arthur Olm, and the description is, I'm paraphrasing the first part, but it's something like, she let out a little whimper of pleasure and pain, who can tell with women. Which again is sexist, but Arthur Olm is saying that, so I don't count that as a Vonnegut, because Kurt Vonnegut is not saying that. He rammed the old Avenger home euphemism for he had sex with her without against her will right then it says elliot found himself possessed of an erection oh for heaven's sake he said to his procreative organ how irrelevant can you be and i get that it shouldn't technically be a because he's literally saying man dicks are so stupid it's almost like a stand-up observation like i'll get a hard on really because of a rape Like, I'm not a rapist. I don't condone rape. (laughs) And he's saying, like, how dare you, my dick, get hard about a rape. That's so stupid. But I got to say, you read one sentence about a rape encounter and immediately got a raging heart on. Yeah. (laughs) That's actually weird to me. (laughs) Because all he read so far was one sentence of a guy describing with a euphemism that he's raping a woman. And he's like, schwing. (laughs) So I thought that was weird. I just thought like yeah. it was an overreact. I get his point. That is pretty. But yeah. that's fast. <laughs> One <laughs> sentence into the rape story, he's hard. Yeah. Ooh. Not right. Yeah, now yep. you go. <laughs> <laughs> I think that I think that's most of my Vano Watts. Did, did right. you have any other? I think I had one more. He says of Fred, sons of suicide seldom do well in life. And I just don't think there's any way he has data on that. (laughs) I don't think Kurt ran around tracking the success of Children of Suicides. Yeah. I don't think there is data on that. (laughs) Maybe there is from people trying to prevent suicide. But uh, I thought it was a mean thing to say when you don't know. You can't back that up. (laughs) Yeah. But he describes Fred repeatedly as doomed because his parent committed suicide. And I admit it's sad. But I don't think you live under a pall where your life can never... Go yeah. well. <laughs> yeah, calling anyone doomed because of something like that is a little harsh. Yeah. Yeah. The Vonnegut, <laughs> the Vonnegut what that always occurs to me 
especially about women, but about a lot of people is he writes people off entirely. Yeah. And he does it for noble reasons because he's just using a, and it doesn't, it's a fake person. So he's not like insulting them. Yeah. But he writes people off entirely to use them as a symbol. But it's like, man, I can't but help but imagine if that was a real person, how fucking harsh. <laughs> if Diana Moon Glampers read your description of her, she'd be like, that's not nice at all. <laughs> like, <you know? laughs> he's like, her face was a burlap sack that anyone would burn if they saw it. <laughs> Elliot liked her though. Elliot seems nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Elliot's all right. Yeah. Well, speaking of him, I think we can get into another segment called The Meat. Mm. Yum, 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 yum. Oh! I was trying to do putting what a big heavy that? piece of meat oh, there we are. on the butcher's <laughs> counter, but it didn't work out. I was just nibbling at it, I think. Yum, yum, yum. No. With The Meat, we've talked about inequality quite a bit. That's obviously a huge part of this book and the big thing. It also feels worth going over whether Elliot is a good person or a bad person. Or, and we talked about this a little bit, but whether he's just completely ineffectual, whether he's really yeah. hurting everyone in his life, because I don't know exactly what stance the book takes on it. I don't know what stance the book takes. I'll, get, I'll show you my meat. I'll whip my meat out right now. Do it. It's a short meat, but I'll show it to you anyway. <laughs> my meat on this is that, obviously, you can tell by now, if you didn't already know from my other writing and stuff, I believe that uh, money is distributed unfairly right now in human history. Yeah. And it would be nice if it was distributed more fairly. I do think we pride ourselves on being a meritocracy, but it's not a true meritocracy because there's so many loopholes and the system's been gamed so much. And there's a lot of progress to be made there. That said, as I also pulled out earlier, I really go back and forth on the micro-macro issue. Like, we should be doing everything that we can all at once. But I kind of think Elliot took a step down in terms of real-world impact when he went from donating money to helpful organizations and changed to individually helping very poor people himself in person. Yeah, It feels better. It feels more real. For him, I'm sure it did. But I actually think the way to fix things is really boring shit, which is why it's so hard to fix. Like right. getting enough people to come out and vote for something like... <laughs> <laughs> you know, regulating this or deregulating that. I don't want to get into specifics because it's not a political podcast. Yeah. But whatever you believe is the solution, the answer is it's really boring. It's to get that legislation to happen or to get grassroots movements that raise awareness that eventually get that legislation to come about. You right. know, it's dry, tedious, slow work to fix what's wrong with America. Yeah. Well, I think, I, I, so I don't know that Elliot helped anyone in the long run, but it doesn't diminish anything from how much it meant to Diana Moon Glampers that he was there for her. Yeah. And so Elliot, I think in the end, Elliot is good in terms of his, not just his intention. Like I think in the end, he's good in terms of also what he accomplishes and what he's able to do for people. Right. I was just imagining a way he could be even better, I guess. But I think the moral of the story is definitely you want to be an Elliot more than a Lister. Yeah. But I do have that Lister Ames problem with you have to find the difference between unconditional love for all your fellow people and animals, if you extend it that far, yeah. and the love that's special that you share for people that are like in your life. <laughs> right, right. No, that's I the, agree with him that that should be differentiable. Probably. That's the damning thing about Elliot for sure. Yeah. And like the people that he's meant so much to in their lives, he doesn't even remember. Right. Like someone will come and say, Elliot, I need help again. And he'll go, great, let's help you out. Let's hook you up. And he'll forget their name and not know they met, even though they've been coming into the Rosewater Foundation every day for a year. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, it's that truly unconditional love that you imagine Jesus would have where everyone gets the same, like, I love you, my child. If you were Mary Magdalene and you wanted Jesus to love you in a special way that's more than he loves other people, <laughs> that would feel weird. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. It would yeah, it'd be horrible. Yeah. Love is possessive and jealous. Why don't we do another segment? How about that? Do it. Well, there's only a few more to go. One of them you wanted to hit is this is a new one just for this book, maybe for others, but it's called Altruism Olympics. Oh yeah, I forgot we were doing this. <laughs> Which is not a theme song. <laughs> oh what? If I remember the Olympic theme, I would hum it. Yeah. The brief idea is to think about if we were Elliot and we had a pile of money that we could distribute a couple of times, what would we do? I think we should go with $3.5 million, which is the amount of money he gets every year. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. From the foundation. Yeah. Well, mine... Gulp. Yeah, you go. Mine, it's, I think the two issues would be, one is clean water, just for people. Especially infrastructure is breaking down in a lot of places. Especially if you want to avert World War III. It's probably a good idea to get everyone the water they need. 
Yeah, that, that could end the world that yeah. there's not enough clean water <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Yeah, and there are also just a lot of American cities have pipes built in the fashion and around the era that say Flint's pipes were built yeah. and things like that. And there just needs to be a lot of work done fixing that up for people, and that would yeah. be the key thing. And then the other thing would be early elementary education and reading. I think that needs more investment. They've done a lot. There are a lot of studies that show that if they invest in that specifically, that's where you get maybe the most educational bang for your buck. Because then if a child reads well and reads fluently to the point where they maybe even enjoy reading, then they learn mm -hmm. about everything else. I'd keep it. I'd just keep it. Are we allowed to keep it? I'll take the bronze. I don't need the gold medal in this Olympics. Okay. I'll well, just keep great. the money and be that moral. No, education as well. But the most recent study I heard that hasn't been debunked yet no, my, was that yeah. the single most impactful thing, especially for developing a third world nation, is the education of women. And it makes a lot of sense to me. Oh, if you look from the yeah, uh, I was thinking just America for the most part. Evolutionary. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Evolutionary standpoint, when women are educated, they start to, as like a cofactor of that trend, usually take more control over their body and procreative rights. Yeah. And that results in more stable family units, which I'm not saying is the be all end all of society, but there's a trend where that seems to stabilize things in the society and make gross national happiness improve over time. Yeah. So educating young women, I would use all the money to educate young women, but it does bring us to the thing where it's like, yeah, that's what's so crazy about it is I could read another study where it turns out there was something better I could have done. You right. don't know. Cause I was like, I would go to the country because I kind of believe that everyone on earth should get a fair shake and don't care about borders. Mm. So I would put the money in the country that is where the money is worth the most money. Yeah, that does that makes make sense. sense? No, it does. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like micro loans, I think are a really cool idea because yeah. it takes people where it says, look, it's the, it's the soul of capital redistribution to use $7 is nothing, but this guy can start or, you know, can run his business for a week on $7. So right. you loan him $7, and that's a great thing, or give it to him, hopefully. So I'd, I'd be all down with microloans and, and sending all our money to the third world, and I bet a lot of people think that's a terrible idea. Yeah. But I don't know if I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> well, it does, yeah, even just free markets, like it makes a lot of sense in terms of, like you said, that bang yeah. for a buck. Yeah. Yeah. We well, solved it. We both win gold. Economic inequity Perfect. is done. Yep. Why don't we move to another segment for this text called Kurt Vonnegrades. Sonic grades, sonic grades. Let's give those grades. Yeah, we went in different directions, but <laughs> I think it like worked a, well that's together. That was like a, a Dolby sound or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. So as we've said before, in Palm Sunday, Kurt graded a bunch of his books relative to himself. In this case, with God Bless You, Mr. Rosewater, he gave himself an A, which is the same grade he gave to Sirens of Titan, Mother Night, and Jailbird. Straight up A. Agree. I'll give it straight up the A as well. Yeah. Complex, challenging. If it was just a shade less transparent that it was a loosely connected selection of rants about the economy, I'd go for that plus. But I still think it's an A because uh, when I read it, I can tell, oh, the plot driving forward is not the focus. So if you accept it on its own terms, it's a collection, it's an exploration of this theme. Yeah. I, think, I, don't, I can't imagine a better version of it or a yeah. film version for that matter. I think it's notable that we're not really going to talk about a film version this time. Because it makes a better book. It wouldn't be that great as a movie, I don't think. It'd be hard to do, yeah. Yeah. And that's interesting. Well, we can, we can get into that. Sure. Uh, I, grade wise, I would give it, I think I would give it like a B plus or All so. Right. And I like it quite a bit. I think the theme of inequality and the way he attacks it, it's super important. It's super well done. It is so loose, though. There are parts in the middle that dragged somewhat for me, and it, it, it's not quite. It just didn't quite hit on the level that some of his other ones have. All right. Me. Well, we are but enemies it's pretty now. Well done. Yeah. And this is the last episode of the podcast. We'll Bye. Fight later. <laughs> no, come back. Blast what's up? What's up? What's up? Door. But those are our grades. And I can see why it rated higher for sure. There's. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm waiting to give him a D. I really want to just come in and hate something, but I don't think it's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. That hasn't quite. Yeah. It might be a while or never. We'll see. And yeah, we can move. We aren't going to dive way into it, but our next segment called Movie Time. I didn't know we were doing this segment, so I'm not prepared. We, uh, <laughs> But I in general agree with you that I think it would be hard to put together sure. as a movie and hard to make. I did think the one person who I think could do a pretty good 
job maybe of making it might be Scorsese. Ah, because I, think, I thought you might go McKay again because the big short. Yeah, somewhat him. But I think because this book has a lot of speeches, a lot of quick runs through family history mm-hmm. and and a lot of no need to develop characters. any female characters, which Scorsese <laughs> needs if he's going to do a movie. <laughs> right. And so he could he could really good fellas a lot of the speeches <laughs> yeah. and the movements through time and the oh, and then this happened and then that happened. And I also feel like it has that huge shift toward the end where Indianapolis is bathed in fire and then he wakes up in a mental institution. I've... And that reminded me of Raging Bull a little bit where there's and suddenly it's a that book, big yeah. break and suddenly we're in a new situation. And like you, I almost imagine the whole first chunk of the story in black and white and then in color at the end kind of transition. I can see that. Like that. I guess that's why I think it doesn't work though is it cuts and it's six months later and then if it were a film scene within three minutes the main character solves the challenge just by saying something. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Just from screenwriting rules, that's a very like flaccid, lame ending that there's a problem set up. You cut It's six months later. The main character narrates what the solution is going to be. End of movie. Right. You want a guy in the rain with a (laughs) boom box or something exploding. Like you want something to happen. That's all. (laughs) Yeah. And I almost feel like the mother night movie ran into some of that where there's elements of the way that plot is structured, where it, there's things movies do that I feel. (laughs) But it's got that full stop at the end that saves everything. Not necessarily, but I mean, yeah. If you at least have the main character kill themselves at the end, it feels like something. Yeah. Well, as far as making a movie, this book, movie time is worth doing to an extent because Kurt sure felt like it should be a movie. The book was published in 1965. (laughs) And if you care, as a hardcover through Holt Reinhardt and Winston, who also did Cat's Cradle. And he published it in 1965. And according to his letters, he was almost immediately trying to get it made as a movie. He writes in 1965 to Jane that he sent off a big treatment of the movie to someone named Harrison. I don't know exactly who. Someone in Hollywood. Bergeron. But apparently that worked its way to Alan J. Pakula? Pakula? I don't exactly know. But he's a very big figure in Hollywood in the late 20th century. Ah. He produced To Kill a Mockingbird. He directed Parallax View. He directed All the President's Men. He was a a big deal. Mm -hmm. And they apparently had a big deal set up with him. And as Kurt wrote to William Price Fox in November of 1966... I had a big movie deal with Alan Pakula fall through last week. He wanted to buy Rosewater, but the guy who had the option for peanuts wouldn't sell out, wouldn't let go for anything. I don't think he'll ever make the picture. The contract is a very bad one drawn up by my publishers. God love them. (laughs) And so Kurt was... Kind of hoping they'd break the contract, it sounds like, and get the movie made, almost, courting them in that way. Yeah, something Uh, like that. And also, he also wrote to his wife Jane in 1965 about that treatment. He said, it's full of brand new Rosewater lines and situations. Had to be, since a book is a book and a film is a film, it's kind of a sequel. So I think even Kurt wanted to make it a movie, oh, okay. but, but also felt it that so, yeah. it would have needed a lot of rewriting and changing to work as a movie, which is an interesting thing for an author to be able to recognize for and sure. think. So since then, as far as we know, no one's made a film of it. And uh, Get cracking, listeners. Go for it. From there, let's get into another segment about other texts called Related Reading. Ah. Flippy, 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 flip. Outside texts. This one, we've got a bunch of them for it. I can lead with my own Bradbury, which I do. Uh, do I picked out a really short thing. It's called The Taxpayer, and it's one short chunk of The Martian Chronicles. And it's only a page or two, but it's a little vignette about a guy in Ohio, who says, everybody else is going to Mars, why not me? I'm a taxpayer, I'm a citizen. <laughs> and it could have been How come you comic. can put a man on the moon, but you can't make my shoes smell good? <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, it could have been written very funny or very sad or anywhere in between, but it's just sort of a little brief vignette about how it feels to be a person who's not getting everything they feel they ought to out of their sure. society as it's doing these amazing things maybe elsewhere. Yeah, nice. and it's really well written because it's right. I'll get yeah. my obligatory Harlan Ellison short story out of the way. This time it's On the Slab, hey. one of his most celebrated short stories, if you've heard of him. It might have been because of that, although it was probably because of I Have No Mouth and I'm a Scream, but it could have been because of this. On the Slab, the story of a person who finds buried in their farm the dead, petrified body of a giant, like 80-foot-tall person. 
who turns out to be Prometheus, the ancient Greek god, <laughs> and a bunch of stuff happens. That's the end of that. <laughs> wow. Right back at you. That sounds awesome. Well, I can't anymore is the right. punchline. That's it's very short. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's great. I would also mention that earlier in that tweet from Evan Billings, the short story Microcosmic God by Theodore Sturgeon. Nice. It's about yeah. a scientist who is brilliant and discovers everything he can. And it is a situation where the scientist realizes that he's like anybody else. He's standing on the shoulders of giants. All his discoveries are based on mm -hmm. partly other people's work and inspiration and bouncing off that. And he's out of people to work with because he's too intelligent. Okay. So he starts breeding a super species that will be smarter than us and think of new things. And then yeah. he can work with them. Nice. Like he starts breeding, col uh, collaborating. Uh, he doesn't species. imagine that they might be like, we have no need for you. <laughs> yeah. And so <laughs> the story goes ahead. from there. Yeah. And it's pretty amazing. It's a really good short. Nice. Yeah. Staying on the theme of short stories, The Giving Plague by David Brin. I believe it's the opening short story mm -hmm. of the book Otherness, which I've mentioned before. On this podcast, The Giving Plague is about a scientist who discovers that as society has advanced and become more and more humane and altruistic, like on the whole, the key factor he uses to prove his case is people give blood more and more, which is a purely altruistic thing, just like being a volunteer firefighter. He discovers that the reason we do that is because since the dawn of time, there has been a virus that affects the human brain and lives in the human bloodstream that is slowly uh, oh. spread to be in every single human, and it makes us more altruistic. And the only reason it does that is to encourage us to share blood so that there will be more of it. So it is benign. It doesn't make you sick or anything. It just makes you altruistic, and that's the only reason people aren't still like animals crushing each other's skulls for the delicious brains inside. Yeah. So it posits the question of, would you want the world to be a better place if it was because you were all slaves to an outside entity? Like if Trophamador's oh. ray made the world a good place, would you want that? That's an awesome premise. It's a good dichotomy explored in films like The Matrix, <laughs> but explored with a lot more subtlety and tact, I think, in The Giving Plague. Oh, that sounds amazing. I got two more. What do I you have, got? I have one more, and it's David, okay. a David Brin thing. Oh, awesome. It is a novel of his called The Practice Effect. Don't and know it. it's a little it's a little bit of an oblique one where the premise is that someone from our world ends up on a world where the difference is that entropy is kind of the opposite. So the way things work is as you use something more, it gets nicer. And so <laughs> and cleaner and more ordered yeah, and, and better yeah. and more functional. And the only way to get something good is to make it and then use it a whole bunch rather than like making it and keeping it nice. It's the way practicing yeah. a skill works. You yeah. have to start with a piece of shit and get and hone it. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Nice. And so their society on this world is this, I would call horrible feudal society <laughs> where there's a few very rich people and they're rich because they have tons of servants to practice their stuff for them all of the I time see, yeah. <laughs> keep using their axes and stuff to make it nice yeah and so it among other things is sort of flips it's a completely different version of a very unequal society and so yeah. it's a nice lens into ours because you think nice. it's it kind of takes you out of ours to think about ours cool yeah well, I'll skip right over Transmetropolitan by Warren Ellis, because A, a lot of people listening probably know it. But it's a great series of graphic novels that follow sort of a Hunter S. Thompson sound alike in a dystopian future ruled by mass media and corporation. Cool. It's kind of like Hunter S. Thompson meets Black Mirror a little bit. And it's a lot like Mr. Rosewater, because the plot is nothing more than an excuse to have a bunch of interesting essays and observations about society and society's trends. Right. And then I'm going to close mine out with the only full actual book book I'm going to recommend this time by Robert Lynn Asprin called The Cold Cash War. Asprin, always. I love always Asprin, Asprin and so does Kurt. <laughs> and uh, The Cold Cash War is a great one-off he wrote, very short, that sort of takes these themes to a much more literal, like, sci-fi Starship Troopers fighting place. So in the future, cultures don't fight because it's inhumane to take life. Like, we've evolved to the point where we don't murder anymore, including yeah. wars. We don't have soldiers. What we've agreed to do is all wear really fancy laser tag outfits that when you get shot in a limb, it freezes it immobily. Oh. If you've read Ender's Game, they right, use the same very, technology. Yeah, but yeah, if you get shot, you become a frozen and immobile. And at the end of a battle, which is agreed upon, like we'll have a battle on this day at this place, they tally up how many people you killed, and the loser has to pay an amount of money. Like, you get points, right? Oh. So if you lost more men, the losing country owes you 
20 billion dollars and basically wars are fought by bankrupting the other countries oh. but what's fucking crazy is then they do a he does a great job of exploring crazy shit that would happen as a result of that like it's a whole new revolution of violence when they realize what we need to be doing is assassinating the leaders of these corporations and oh. so they start doing that or like right. really dedicated soldiers start burying themselves alive if they get hit so that it, their score won't get docked from their team's overall score. Oh, so it just explores all the angles of like literally equating life to money only. And if, if cultures yeah. were willing to be like, look, we all admit money is life. Let's have war using only money. <laughs> That's amazing. And it's fun. It's cool. Yeah. yeah. So cool. That's all I got. Yeah. Well, and uh, I think we can move to it's uh, the last segment, I think, but it's called Monaghan News. Nice. Nice, nice, and naughty. <laughs> it's very Christmas. Sure. Uh, yeah, got to throw some holiday cheer in there. Yeah. So we are, we're recording this late December. So there's not any particular new news, but there's one piece of news to sort of repeat, which is that there's going to be a cast recording of the revival of the musical version of God Bless You, Mr. Rosewater, because <laughs> we haven't seen it, but there's a musical of it. And there will be a text only game. Of the musical, of the comic, of a painting of God Bless You, Mr. Rosewater, and we're right. all really looking forward to it. The one adaptation. <laughs> yeah. But it's actually, it's a fascinating piece of work to me, because it's a musical that was made in 1979 originally, and the music is by Alan Menken, and the lyrics were by Howard Ashman. And nice. Menken and Ashman are a huge deal if you like their other stuff, because that's Little Shop of Horrors, that's Disney's Little Mermaid, Disney's Beauty and the Beast, and then... Parts of Aladdin, Ashman died of AIDS in the early 90s, but their run of work is a lot of stuff you know, yeah. and this Vonnegut musical that very few of us have ever heard or seen. And there's also an amazing piece on Playbill about the creation of that first musical. Apparently, Howard Ashman read this book when he was 17 and felt like it read like a musical and that's the one that that's the one i to don't make see that at all that's so interesting i don't see it either yeah. i don't know what that play is but I, yeah I'm it's really crazy curious. to even think what the songs will be yeah and it's the, the and distribution it's, of wealth it's like <laughs> right it's it like doesn't one lend one. itself to a musical to me yeah i don't know what it would be. but uh and apparently kurt showed up to watch them rehearse because they did it as an uh -huh. off-broadway card and he just showed up unannounced and everyone freaked out and they and then uh they almost cast Kurt in the show because they thought about stunt casting a new Kilgore Trout every night and the first one would be Kurt. That's and so, funny. Yeah. Which is an amazing idea. They didn't end up yeah. going through with it. But that play... <laughs> the last one would be an actual Trout. Right. And then they closed the show. Yeah. That would ruin the show. But it, uh, but that play launched Ashman and Menken into making probably a lot of things you love from there. That They had never worked together before. They were recommended to each other by a friend to work on the project and then that was it. That launched a lot of the the big Disney and otherwise stuff of musical theater. Nice. Yeah. And so the, the revival they did, the cast had Santino Fontana from crazy ex-girlfriend as Elliot. They had Skylar Aston from pitch perfect as Mushari. And then they had James Earl Jones as Kilgore trout, mm. which I, again, don't know how that would work, but That's great. Great. Let's see. So that album is going to be out at some point. We can all hear that music Excellent. and we'll probably check it out. Yeah. And I think that's all for God bless you, Mr. Rosewater. What a book. This was great. What a time. And if you're keeping up with us, we're looking at chronologically the next big published thing is Welcome to the Monkey House in 1968. And that was sort of a reboot revamp of Canary in a Cat House, which was much earlier. But it's a collection of August short stories. That's going to be our next episode is Welcome to the Monkey House. And our first short story collection. And so our we'll first see... set of short stories. Anything that's not a novel, yeah. really. Yeah. How Kurt handles short form. Yeah, and we'll, and that'll let us range across a lot of his years of work from before any yeah. of his novels to, to into the late 60s, which will be really great. It will. So that's next up for us, yep. and thank you for listening. And Thanks, guys. You're the best fun of friends. It's true. 